Планета Земля. Миллионы лет ее. Planet Earth. For millions of years, it was managed by the elements. Earth, air, water changed landscape, and they changed with the eras. Nature provided life to everything that is alive on Earth, including mankind. But at the beginning of the 21st century, mankind brought the planet to the brink of an abyss. Life emerged from water, which is thoroughly lacking, to avoid wars for this precious resource, to make access equitable is our objective. Right now, the world is a fire with injustice. The old world order is bursting at the seams, but it cannot go on. The paradigm for the new world order and the future economy should be based upon opportunities for everyone. The global consumption system has landed us in the worst sense of the world. Our souls have been brought hollow and we forgot about why we live and only looking into the abyss many were gripped by true fear but there is still a chance to save the world as air uh, the humanity requires compromises the world can no longer be divided into coalitions into them and us we need to listen to one another and have the courage to take unpopular but important decisions. Russia is open to global changes. We are a territory that brings together the West and the East. We are a bridge for economies and cultures, a bridge for the future. We offer new opportunities to emerge from the crisis, from wars and conflicts. We can do that if we really want it. President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jomart Tokayev. Moderating the plenary session is Margarita Simonyan. Good afternoon. Very soon it's going to be evening. You know, there were some technical difficulties, but they were swiftly resolved. I would like to thank those who helped in resolving those issues. I would like to thank the audience. I would like to thank our leader, Vladimir Putin. As usual, you found the time to speak at the forum to tell us what is awaiting us from the economic point of view, but in other domains as well. Thank you, President. Tokayev for finding the time to come here because it's not that simple. Thank you for supporting both our forum and our country. We appreciate that enormously. We have questions ahead and probably you're not going to be pleased to listen to all of them and I'm not going to be pleased to ask all of them. We would like to talk only about the good things, but it's not going to be able to, to be, it's not going to be possible. But meanwhile, I would like to invite President Putin to the podium to speak. Thank you, President Tokayev, friends, colleagues. I would like to welcome the participants and the guests of the anniversary 25th St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. It's taking place and a difficult time for the whole of the economic of the world community. The economy, the markets, the very principles of the global economic systems have come under threat. Many trade, manufacturing, logistical ties earlier disrupted by the pandemic are being tested yet again. Moreover, such key business notions as the goodwill, the sacred sanct, nature of property and trust in world currencies have been significantly undermined, unfortunately, by our colleagues in the West. And it was done deliberately for the sake of ambitions to preserve 
outdated geopolitical illusions. Today, I would like to uh, expound on my view, on the view of the global leadership about the current state of affairs in the global economy. I'm going to dwell on how Russia is acting amid these conditions and how we plan our development in this constantly shifting situation. 18 months ago, I spoke at the Davos Forum, and I emphasized once again that the unipolar world order era was over. And I would like to take this issue up once again, because it's still relevant, despite all the attempts to preserve the old world order. You know, it's only the natural course of history. Change is the natural course of history, because civilizational diversity of the planet and the richness of cultures can hardly be reconciled with political, economic, and other ready-made templates. Templates won't fly there. Templates that are rudely, categorically being imposed from one single center on others. This very idea is flawed. This very idea that there is one albeit powerful power with a small bevy of close, privileged partners. And all the norms for business community, for international relations when needed, are given an interpretation to benefit these countries. So it's a one-way street, as it were, and the world based on such dogmas by its very nature is unstable. The US declared a victory in the Cold War and later came to think of themselves as God's own messengers on planet Earth who have no duties, only interests. And the latter are declared as sacrosanct. It's as if they choose to ignore that over the recent decade, the planet has seen the emergence and increasing prominence of new powerful centers, each and every center is developing its own political systems, social institutions, implementing their own economic growth models, and certainly they have the right to protect them and to ensure their national sovereignty. I'm talking about objective processes, about truly revolutionary tectonic shifts in geopolitics, global economy, and in technology, and the very system of international relations, which are seeing a growing role of dynamic, promising countries and regions whose interests it's no longer possible to ignore. I reiterate, these are fundamental, truly revolutionary and inexorable changes. It would be a mistake to think that during these tumultuous changes, you can simply sit it out, beating your time, that everything is going to get back to its circuits, that everything is going to be as it was. It won't. And yet, it seems as if the ruling elites of certain Western countries are laboring under precisely these very illusions, choosing to ignore the obvious, persistently clinging to the ghosts of the past. In particular, they think that the domination of the West in global politics and economics is a constant, but nothing is peremptory, nothing is eternal. Moreover, our colleagues are not simply denying the reality. They are trying to oppose the course of history, thinking in the past categories, laboring under their own delusions about countries that live outside the so-called golden billion. They think that the rest of the world is periphery, their own backyard. And they still treat those countries as their colonies, and people who live there well, they are considered to be second rate because they think of themselves as exclusive, as something first rate. And that's why they have this irrepressible desire to economically crush those who break the mold, who refuses to blindly follow. They rudely and brazenly obtrude their ethics, cultural and historical views, sometimes call into question the sovereignty and integrity of countries and threaten their own existence. Suffice it to remember what happened to Yugoslavia, Syria, Iraq. And if they fail to keep these rebels, so to speak, in check, they try to isolate them and a council. They use everything, sport, the Olympic movement, bans on culture and art masterpieces due to the sole reason that their authors have their own origins. And this is the nature of the current bout of Russophobia in the West, as well as the reckless sanctions against Russia. I would say reckless and insane sanctions. 
the number and the rate at which these sanctions are rubber stamped, well, it's unprecedented. I understand the rationale. They tried to en crush Russian economy in one go by force, disrupting business chains, making Western companies leave the Russian market, freezing our assets, dealing a blow to the industry, to finance, to the level of life of our people. But it didn't work. The Russian enterprises and uh, government authorities worked in a composed and professional manner. The citizens uh, stand united and they assume responsibility. We're normalizing the economic situation. We stabilized the financial markets, the banking system, the trade system, and we injected liquidity and working capital into the economy to ensure the sustainability of enterprises and companies, employment and jobs. The gloomy predictions with regard to the prospect of the Russian economy that we heard in the beginning of spring didn't realize, but I understand where this propaganda campaign comes from where these mantras about the dollar at 200 rubles and the inevitable and rapid collapse of our economy. This is a tool of information warfare, a factor of psychological influence on our society and on our business circles. Incidentally, some of our experts fell victim to this external pressure. And their calculation and estimates, they assumed that our GDP would inevitably plummet and ruble would depreciate critically, but the life itself proved wrong, these predictions. But I would like to emphasize that in order to be successful, we need to be frank and realistic in our assessment of the situation. We have to be independent in drawing our conclusions and we believe in ourselves. We're a strong nation, strong people, and we are up to any challenge. And as our forefathers, we can find a solution to any task. And this is proved by the thousand years of history of Russia. Three months after the full blown package of sanctions, we suppressed the inflation surge. It peaked at 17.8%. Right now, it's gone down to 16.7% and continues to decrease. The economic dynamics has been stabilized. The public finance is stable. I'm going to draw a parallel with other regions later. Yes, of course, it's too much. 16.7% of inflation is a big number, and we will have to address that, and I'm confident that we will be successful. Over the first five months this year, the federal budget has a surplus of 1.5 trillion rubles, whereas the consolidated budget has a, a surplus of 3.3 trillion rubles. Incidentally, in May alone, the surplus of the federal budget stood at 500 billion rubles, which is four times what we saw last year in Maine. Right now, we need to boost production, boost the supply in the domestic market. And based on the growth of supply, we have to rebuild and demand and bank banking lending. I said that we've taken measures to top up the working capital of capitals. Almost in all areas, business has the right to get deferrals and insurance payments over the second quarter this year. Manufacturing capacities have greater opportunities. They can resort to this deferral in the third quarter, too. Basically, it is an interest-free loan from the government. Later on, they won't have to pay these insurance payments. At, in one go, they will be able to do that in regular installments for the 12 months starting from June next year. Starting from May, we brought down the concessional mortgage loan rate. Right now, it stands at 9%. The very concessional mortgage program has been extended until the end of the year. I said this measure seeks to help citizens to address their housing issues and to support the construction industry and related industries, and they employ millions of people. After a drastic surge in spring, Interest rates in the Russian economy are steadily going down. The central bank has brought down the key rate, and that is why I believe that we can once again bring down the concessional mortgage rate down to 7% this time. 
But I would like to say that this program will be in force until the end of this year. There's been no changes there. So if our citizens would like to use this program, they have to do that until the end of this year. The maximum limits are the same, 12 million for Moscow and St. Petersburg and 6 million for the rest of the regions of Russia. I would like to add that, in general, we need to increase the availability of long-term financial resources and loans for our economy. Very soon, we will have to shift from budget stimulus to market-based banking lending instruments. And this process needs our support. There's no doubt about that. In order to boost the opportunities of the project funding fabric of VEB, we are going to allocate 120 billion rubles from the National Wealth Fund. This will allow additional lending to relevant initiatives and projects to the tune of around 500 billion rubles. Distinguished colleagues, as I mentioned, Previously, the economic blitzkrieg from Russia was doomed from the out very outset. Incidentally, as is well known, and as we know from practice of recent years, sanctions are a double-edged sword. They can deal comparable, if not greater, damage to the authors and developers of these ideas. And I'm not just talking about short-term fallout. We know from leaders of European countries, from uh, informal talks, they are discreetly discussing alarming prospects. They believe that sanctions can be applied not just from Russia, but from any country that falls out of favor. Sooner or later, they can be used against the very members of the EU and European companies. So far, it has not come to this, but the European economies have already dealt a serious blow to their own economies, and they did it themselves. We see an aggravation of social and economic issues in Europe and in the US. We see increases in the prices of goods, food, electricity, as well as car fuel. The standards of living of Europeans are going down. Their enterprises are losing competitiveness. Experts estimate that the direct estimatable losses of the EU from the sanctions fever over this year can be superior to $500 billion. This is the price of these re decisions divorced from reality and taken in contravention, contravention of common sense. These losses are going to be incurred by the population and companies of the EU. Inflation in certain countries is already superior to 20 percent. I've mentioned our inflation rate, but the EU Countries are not pursuing any special military operations, whereas inflation over there has grown up to 20 percent. It's the highest record over the last four decades. So far, inflation in Russia is still in two-digit numbers, but we've already indexed social benefits and pensions, brought up the minimum wages as well as the subsistence level, thereby protecting the lowest income citizens. Whereas high interest rates have allowed us to preserve the savings in Russian banks. Yes, business understands that high interest rate can suppress the economy. But for citizens, mostly, it's an advantage. And a lot of money has been brought back to the banks at a high interest rate. And this is the main difference from the European countries, where inflation results in loss of real income. It eats away at their savings. And the current crisis become a burden for low-income citizens. The costs of European companies are going up, and this will have long-term consequences. They lose the Russian market. They will lose global competitiveness. And there's going to be a systemic slowdown in growth rates in the European economy for many years to come. This only exacerbates the profound issues within Western societies. We have problems of our own. That's true. But this is something we have to say, because they are all constantly pointing a finger at us, and they've got problems of their own. And this is something I spoke about in Davos. European politicians 
and the developments of this year will result directly in deeper inequality in these countries. This will drive a wedge even further into their societies. And it's not just about the wealth, but also differences in values between different groups in these societies. So far, these controversies are suppressed and swept under the carpet. Democratic procedures and elections in Europe, you know, sometimes I watch at what's happening there, who arrives in power. It seems as nothing but a facade because political parties that resemble one another as twins alternate in power, but the very essence remains the same. Real interests of their citizens and national businesses are relegated even further to the background. This loss of touch with reality, with the needs of society, will inevitably result in a recrudescence of populism and a surge in extreme radical movement, as well as social, economic, and political changes, as well as degradation and change in elites. You see, traditional parties are constantly losing in elections. New entities emerge. But if they are hardly different from traditional parties, they do not have many chances of success. All attempts at putting a brave face on a sorry business, all discussions about acceptable losses for the sake of fake unity cannot hide one single fact. The European Union has completely lost its sovereignty, whereas its bureaucratic elites are dancing to someone else's tunes, taking everything what's being dictated to them, dealing harm to their population, to their businesses, to their economy. What is also important is that the deteriorating economic situation is not happening over the recent months. I believe this to be of great importance. This is not a result of what happened over the recent months, nor is it the result of the special military operation pursued by Russia in Donbass. Whoever says that is blatantly and deliberately twisting the facts. A strong spike in inflation in commodity markets and goods markets happened long before this year's developments. The world has had long been following this path over the recent years due to the reckless macroeconomic policies pursued by the G7 countries. I refer in particular to unbridled emission and accumulation of unsecured debts. And these processes have only accelerated once the pandemic of COVID-19 started back in 2020. Back then, on a global level, we saw a drastic shrinking in supply and demand for services and goods. So what does our special military operation in Donbass have to do with that. There's no relation whatsoever. So without being able to devise or without wishing to devise other recipes to overcome these challenges, the Western economies decided to resort to the crude l method of the printing press, printing money, money supply over the last two years increased by 38 percent to the tune of 5.9 trillion US dollars. As for, for the sake of comparison, just a handful of countries across the world can boast a bigger GDP, whereas the money supply in the Eurozone has also drastically increased by around 20 percent, that is, by around 2.5 trillion euros. Recently, I'm sorry. I don't like to mention myself, but very often we, we hear about the so-called Putin-inspired inflation in the West, and when I hear that, I think that it's just plain stupid. It comes from people who don't know how to read and write. People who know how to read understand what is really happening. Our actions to liberate Donbass have nothing to do with that. Right now, there are problems in energy, and this is due to the systemic mistakes in the economic politics of the current U.S. administration and European politicians. This is the only reason for that inflation. A couple of words about mm, our operation. Maybe it had some impact, but still the root cause is 
inflation. And this is uh, a golden opportunity for them because they can pin the blame on Russia for all of their failures. But anyone who studied at school understands where the situation comes from. They printed a whole load of money. And where did this money go into? Obviously, in particular, this money was used to procure goods and services outside Western countries. That's where this money went into. They started to clean out global markets without a single thought for the interests of other countries, let alone poorest countries. They were left with nothing but crumbs coming at astronomical prices to boot. In late 2019, U.S. import stood at around $250 billion per month, whereas by now it has increased to $350 billion. Incidentally, the growth rate is around 40 percent. As a ratio, this is fully commensurate with this unsecured injection of money supply that has happened over the recent Yes, they printed new money, used this money to buy goods and services. I would also like to add the following. For a long period of time, the U.S. was a big supplier in the food market. And quite justifiably, they were proud of that. They were proud of their agriculture, farming traditions. It was a good example for many, us included. But right now, the role of America is drastically changed. It used to be a net exporter of food, and right now it's a net importer. In other words, they print money and they divert goods flows to their benefit, buying food from across the world. Even higher rates of import growth can be seen in the EU. Yes, this increase in demand, which is not secured, by the supply of goods has set off a wave of global inflation. That's where it comes from over the last two years. Everything in the world has become pricier. Commodities, consumer goods, and food. And these countries continue to import. But right now, the mismatch between import and export is different. Right now, import is by 17 billion or so more than export. According to the UN, in February this year, the food price index stood at 50% more than May 2020, whereas the aggregate commodity price index doubled over the same period of time. Amid this inflationary storm, many developing countries are asking the only reasonable question, why change goods for dollars and euros that are depreciating in front of us? The conclusion begs itself. The economy of simulacra is inevitably going to be replaced by the economy and real assets and values. The IMF estimates that the world currency reserves currently have $7.1 trillion and 2.5 trillion euros, and this money is depreciating at the rate of around 8% per year. Moreover, this money can be seized and stolen if the U.S. doesn't like something about the policies pursued by this or that country, and this has become a reality for many countries that still have their currencies and foreign currencies. Experts estimate, and this is just objective analysis, in the next years, global reserves will start to be converted. Well, given the deficit, they will be converted from depreciating currencies into real resources. And the countries will pursue this path. I refer to such real resources as food and energy, and this process will only push forth the dollar inflation. Regarding Europe, the rising prices are further exacerbated by their fiascos in the energy policy they pursue. They were blindly counting on renewables and spot supplies of natural gas, which resulted in a drastic increase in the price of energy. We've been seeing that starting from the third quarter last year. And I reiterate, it happened long before the beginning of our military operation in Donbass. We have nothing to do with that. They did it themselves. 
the prices were soaring and they're trying to bin it on someone else. And these failures resulted in the bigger prices for many goods and services and also lower output of fertilizers, especially nitrogen fertilizers, from mid-2021 to February this year. The global fertilizer prices have grown by more than 70 percent. Unfortunately, we see no signs that these price trends are going to be reversed anytime soon. Quite the contrary, this situation is exacerbated by the blockage of the work of our uh, enterprises and fertilizer producers in Belarus and in Russia. And it's easy to calculate how it's going to play out because shortages of fertilizers will result in lower crops. There's going to be a bigger risk of undersupply of food for the world market. Prices will climb further up, and this carries the risk of famine in the poorest countries. And of course, the blame is on the U.S. and the Euro bureaucracy. And this problem did not emerge today. And Regardless of what certain demagogues are saying, Russia is certainly not to blame, even though they are trying to pin the blame on us, on everything that's happening in the world economy. Yes, it would be flattering to us to hear that we are all powerful, that we've driven inflation rates in the US and in the West and Europe sky high. Yes, it might be flattering to us to feel this might and power, but it's simply not the reality. This situation has been forming over many years, spurred on by short-sighted actions of those who like to address their own issues at someone else's expenses, by those who still rely on financial emission to redivert goods flows to their advantage, thereby exacerbating the deficits and humanitarian catastrophes in certain regions of the world. Basically, this is this very same colonial policy. This is the new edition. It's far more sophisticated. You won't be able to understand what's happening at first sight. Right now, the most important task for us is to boost the supplies of food to the global market, satisfying the needs of countries that are needed most direly. Russia is satisfying its own domestic needs, but it is still capable of significantly increasing the exports of food and fertilizers. Next season, our grain exports can rise to 50 million tons. We'll prioritize supplies to those countries that need food most, where there are risks that the number of starving people will increase. I refer in particular to the African countries and to the Middle East. At the same time, there are problems. And once again, we're not to blame for those difficulties. Yes, officially, Russian grain, food, and fertilizers. Incidentally, the US imposed sanctions on fertilizers. Then the Europeans followed the suit. Then the U.S. simply canceled these sanctions, but the Europeans didn't because, you know, their bureaucracy is working like the millstone at a mill of the 17th century. They understand that that's silly, but they cannot backtrack due to bureaucratic concerns. I reiterate, Russia stands willing to make its own contribution to rebalancing the world agricultural markets. And we take note that our colleagues from the UN are open to engage in a dialogue on this issue because they understand the acuteness of the global food problem. We could talk in the course of this discussion about creating normal conditions from the point of view of logistics, finance, and transport to boost Russian exports of food and fertilizers. Unfortunately, there are many speculations about other matter, about Ukrainian supplies of food to the world markets. We're not preventing these supplies because we were not the ones to plant mines around their Black Sea ports. They can demine that, and we will ensure the security of these vessels. No doubt about that. But the U.S. Department of Agriculture estimate that it's 6 million tons of wheat. We believe it's 5 million, another 7 ton of corn. But, you know, 
800 million tons of wheat is produced across the world, so 5 million is a drop in the bucket. Moreover, there are opportunities to export that. You can do that through the Black Sea ports, through Belarus, through Poland, through Romania. There are paths, there are five or six routes that can be used. So we are not the ones to blame. It's about how reasonable the people sitting in Kiev are. It's up to them to decide. And they shouldn't listen to their foreign masters from the other side of the ocean. But there is another threat that it's going to be exacerbated. Colleagues, the world right now is undergoing fundamental shifts. International institutions are breaking down or malfunctioning. Security guarantees are losing value. The West has categorically refused to implement responsibilities it had assumed in the past. And it was simply impossible. And the current conditions amid the rising risks and threats, Russia's decision to start the special military operation was forced and absolutely necessary, if very difficult. This is a decision which is our sovereign right because it's based on the UN Charter, which says that we have the right to protect our security. This decision seeks to protect citizens, citizens of the Donbas republics who for eight years have been suffering from genocide carried out by the Kyiv regime and neo-Nazis under full protection from the West. The West is trying to uh, project its military power of Ukraine, pumping Ukraine full with arms, weapons, and military advisors, and they continue to do so. And as for economic development and the welfare of people who live there, they don't give two hoots about that. But they spare no money on creating a NATO springboard in the West against Russia or on fueling aggression, hatred, and Russophobia. Right now, our soldiers and officers and the militiamen from Donbass are fighting on their land, protecting Russia's right for to free and safe development as a multinational country that determines its future on its own, based on its history, culture, and traditions. We reject any attempts at imposing on us fake values of dehumanization and moral depravity. All goals of the special military operation will be accomplished, which is reinforced by the courage and heroic actions of our warriors, by the consolidation of Russian society, whose support inspires strength and confidence in our army and navy, by the understanding of the truth and historic justice of our cause of building a strong sovereign Russia. I would like to emphasize that in the 21st century, sovereignty cannot be partial nor fragmentary. All of its elements are equally important. They strengthen and complement one another. That's why it's not just important to protect our political sovereignty and national identity. We should also reinforce everything that lies, underlies our economic autonomy, our financial, human, technological self-sufficiency and independence. The very framework of Western sanctions is based on the false, erroneous assumption that Russian economy is not sovereign, that it's critically vulnerable. And they were so caught up in spreading the myths about Russia's backwardness and the weakness of our position, the world economy and trade, that they came to believe their own inventions. They were simply ignoring real facts. They were ignoring how much our country has changed over the recent years. And these changes were brought about by our careful planning aimed at building a sustainable microeconomic environment to ensure food security, implement input substitution, build our own payment system, and so on and so forth. Yes, sanctions and restrictions have uh, put a great number of tasks in front of us, some 
enterprises are suffering due to shortages of spare parts. Some technological solutions are no longer available to our companies. Logistics has been disrupted. On the other hand, this is opening up new opportunities to us. It's often said, but it's the truth. This is an incentive to build an economy which can boast true, genuine, technological, manufacturing, human, scientific sovereignty. This comprehensive task cannot be accomplished in one go. We have to work on a systemic basis, oriented into the future. And this is the path Russia has chosen, chosen pursuing long-term plans for the development of economic industries, reinforcing our social security, and the current tests can make some corrections and amendments to these plans, but the strategic direction is going to be the same. I would like to dwell today on the key principles that, is, that are going to underline, underlie our country and our economy. The first principle is openness. Truly sovereign countries are always willing to engage in equal partnership and to make a contribution of their own to global development, whereas those who are weak and vulnerable are usually involved in searching for enemies and imposing xenophobia, or they completely lose their identity and autonomy, blindly following in the wake of their sovereign. Russia, even though our Western friends want us to do that desperately, is never going to choose the path of self-isolation or to care. On the contrary, we are going to expand our engagement with everyone who is interested, and there are many who want that. I'm not going to name them, but this is the overwhelming number of people on Earth. I'm not going to name all these countries who want to work with us. Everyone knows them. I'm not going to make a revelation if I say that everyone who wants to work with Russia comes under brazen pressure from the U.S. Sometimes it comes down to direct threats. But this blackmail is of little import. If we're talking about countries that are headed by true leaders who make a very clear distinction between national interests and interests of other players, and Russia is going to build economic cooperation with these countries, promoting new projects, and we are certainly going to work with Western companies who, despite the unprecedented arm twisting, continue to retain successful presence in the Russian market. International cooperation will develop on the solid and predictable foundation of building a convenient and independent payment infrastructure in national currencies and to help our companies with logistics and cooperation. We develop transport corridors, increasing the throughput capacity of railroads, the transshipment capacity of ports in the Arctic, in the West and the South, in particular in the Azov and the Black Sea and Caspian basins. They are going to be the most important part of the North-South corridors that is going to create a sustainable channel of communications with the Middle East and South Asia, we hope that the flow of cargo will begin to grow steadily very soon over these corridors. But it's not just international trade that's important. Russia wants and is willing to develop scientific, technological, cultural, humanitarian, and sport-based cooperation based on the principle of equality and mutual respect. And we will aspire to responsible leadership in all of these domains. The second principle for our long-term development is uh, reliance on entrepreneurial initiative. Each and every private initiative that seeks to benefit Russia should get maximum support. The pandemic and the current developments have once again demonstrated to us the importance of flexibility and economic liberties. Private business, even amid harsh conditions, has shown that it's willing and ready to compete in the global markets, and they adapt to the shift in environment thanks to, to private business. We will continue to alleviate administrative pressure. From 2016 to 2018, we had a moratorium on scheduled inspections of small enterprises. It was later extended until the end of 2022. In 2020, this moratorium was expanded to cover mid-size enterprises. And moreover, the number of surprise inspections was brought down six fourfold. We made a step further. In March this year, we 
decided to forego planned and scheduled inspections of all entrepreneurs, regardless of the size of their business, with one condition, their activity should not be tied to a high risk of dealing damage and harm to citizens and the environment. And the number of scheduled inspections, as compared to last year, has decreased six times. Why am I talking about that in such a detail? Because since the moratorium was introduced, the number of breaches by entrepreneurs, rather than go up, went down. It testifies to the maturity and responsibility of the Russian business. Rather than being compelled to comply with norms and requirements, it should be incentivized to do so. And that means that we can make another radical step. On a permanent basis, we can forego most inspections for the whole of Russian business if its activities are not carrying a high risk of dealing damage. Everyone understands for quite some time there is no need to go around and inspect each and every one. We need a risk-oriented approach, and I request the government to set the concrete parameters for such a reform in the coming months. Another sensitive issue for our business, it is also an issue of national security and economic sustainability. In order to decrease and minimize any type of abuse, any loopholes that allow exerting pressure on entrepreneurs, we are consistent in removing and abolishing vague norms of criminal legislation with regard to so-called economic crimes. In March, a law was signed according to which criminal criminal charges against entrepreneurs uh, that are tax-related will only be uh, brought at the initiative of the tax service, and very soon a draft law is going to be adopted on the statute of limitations and also on the dismissal of criminal charges once the tax arrears have been paid in full. And we have also need in decriminalizing a number of other economic crimes, such as those related to working without a license or without accreditation. This is a very fine issue due to the illegitimate actions of our Western partners. They refuse us these licenses. In these types of situations, our government agencies should not you know, push our companies towards crimes. You understand what kind of the situation we're in. And those who work in small and medium enterprises, the license runs out, and the Western companies are not extending these licenses. So what are they to do? Are they to shut down their business? Of course not. Moreover, we should think about increasing the threshold for responsibility in case of arrears and customs and other obligatory payments. Moreover, it's been very long since we updated the parameters for defining big uh, uh, damage and particularly big damages despite the inflation. And also there is a mismatch. You know, the uh, accumulated inflation is around 50 percent and there's no update for a very long time. We also need to revisit the grounds for detention against entrepreneurs and also set the deadlines for pretrial investigations. We understand that these norms are very often resorted to when there is no objective necessity to do so. As a result, some companies have to suspend their activities or outright shut down, and this incurs losses. They can lose their market standing, jobs, their goodwill and authority and reputation of their leaders. And I would like to uh, draw the attention of our law enforcement agencies to this matter. They need to put an end to this practice. And I would like to request the government to work together with the Supreme Court to draft the requisite amendments to the legislation. And I would like them to do that before October the 1st this year. On an additional note, through the Security Council, I have instructed to carry out a special analysis of the cases when criminal charges are brought but do not reach trial. And the number of such cases has significantly grown over the last year. Everyone understands why this happens very often. There are no sufficient grounds to bring charges. Sometimes they 
these charges are used to exert pressure on individuals or companies. We'll talk about additional measures and we'll talk about how to organize the activities of our law enforcement agencies. No doubt, modern business environment is facilitated by regional management teams. At SPIF, as a tradition, I take note of those Russian regions that have achieved great headway in national investment climate score that's prepared by the Strategic Initiative Agency. We have certain changes in the first three rankers, Moscow and Tatarstan this year, and their still leaders are joined by the Moscow region, uh, jumped to the third place from the eighth place. Among the top rankers are Tula, Nizhny Novgorod, two men, Novgorod, Sakhalin, region St. Petersburg and Bashkortostan. On a particular note, I would like to take note of the regions that have made most progress. These are Kurgan region by 36 positions, Perm and Altai Krai by 26 positions, and Gushetia by 24 positions, and Ivanova region that has risen 17 positions. I would like to offer my congratulations to my colleagues from these regions, and uh, I would like to say thank you to them. The federal government is also paying particular attention to supporting business initiatives of our citizens in small c cities and remote areas in rural areas, and the same goes for the regional and the municipal level. And we have some success stories, such as uh, software, environmentally friendly goods, self-made products across the country that have been sold through Russian marketplaces, online marketplaces. We need to create new opportunities, implement new models of trade, including e-trade platforms. We need to bring down logistics, transport, and other types of cost, in particular through the modernized offices of the Post of Russia. We have to help the employers of small companies, self-employed citizens, novice entrepreneurs. We have to help them get additional skills and competencies. We have the relevant measures that target small towns, rural areas, and remote areas and territories, and I would like to enter them as a special category into the national project on SMEs. I would like to address the owners and the heads of big companies and top managers, colleagues, friends, genuine, solid success, sense of dignity, and self-respect only come when you tie your future and the future of your children to your country, to your homeland. We've known each other for many years, and I know the sentiments of many companies, heads, and owners, and it's from you that I've heard on many occasions that businesses, more than just making money, it's about improving the lives around you, it's about contributing to the development of your cities, your regions, your countries, and serving your people and society. This cannot be replaced by anything else. This is the very essence of business. And the recent developments only vindicate that. It's safe for home. And those who chose not to listen to this obvious message lost hundreds, if not billions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in the West. And that's how this safe haven for capital turned out to be. Once again, addressing colleagues who are here in the hall and those who are not here, I would like to call on you not to fall into the same trap again, because our country boasts a huge potential and there is a host of issues that need to be addressed at home, invest at home, invest into new enterprises and jobs and tourist infrastructure, support schools, universities, healthcare, social security system, culture and sport. I know that you are doing that, many of you, but I would like to emphasize that once again. That was the high understanding of their lofty mission by the Bakrushins, Morozovs, Shukins, Rabushinskis, Akturins, Gailevs, 
Apanayevs, Matsyevs, by Mamontov, Trechikov, Asanov, Dadashev, Gachiev, many Russian, Tata, Buria, Chechen, Dagestans, Yakutian, Ossetian, Jewish, Armenian, merchant and entrepreneurial families and representatives of other peoples of the multinational Russia. And these people have entered their names into the annals of our history. Incidentally, on a particular note, I would like to highlight the following. For possible successors of the capital, I don't know what's more important, the money they get, the property, or maybe the goodwill, the good name, and the contribution of their forefathers to their country's future. It's not going to be squandered by anyone, pardon this expression. And the good name is going to be with the descendants. It's going to follow them from many generations to many generations. It's going to be a better support than money and property. Distinguished colleagues, the third principle of our long-term development is a responsible and well-balanced macroeconomic policy. It's precisely this policy that has allowed us to withstand the unprecedented sanction pressure. And this policy is important not just to respond to the current threats, but in the long run as well. We're not going to relieve the tragic experience of our Western colleagues who have set off the inflation spiral and thrown their finance into disarray. Our goal is to develop our economy steadily for many years to come, decrease the inflation burden for citizens and business, and achieving the long and mid-term target of inflation. We want 4 percent. I started with the inflation figures. But the goal is the same. It's 4 percent. I've already instructed the government to draft proposals on the new fiscal rules that seeks to ensure the predictability of our fiscal policy and to create the most favorable environment to use the external economic conditions to our advantage. We need that to enforce the foundation of our economic growth to address infrastructure and technology-related tasks which serve as the basis for the welfare of our citizens. Yes, some companies are committing suicide. You know, we see that some companies have this suicidal sentiment. And it would be senseless to serialize the money supply with their help. But the main principle is to spend how much you earn. And this principle is peremptory. It's always there. The fourth principle is social justice, economic growth, business initiative, industrial capabilities, scientific and technological potential of Russia should translate into social advancement. And this development should lead to decreasing inequality rather than exacerbating it, as it happens in some countries. We are not champions or the leaders in addressing these tasks. The issue still stands, but still, decreasing poverty and inequality comes through greater demand on domestic produce, through increasing the potential of our regions, through creating new jobs where they're most needed. This is the determining condition for further economic development. The positive dynamics and real wages of our citizens and lower poverty level, these are the main fruits that testify to the efficiency of our government. And we need to improve and to address the objective difficulties. This year, this is the task set forth before the government. And we have to protect the most vulnerable groups, pensioners and families with children, those who found themselves in dire straits. On a yearly basis, pensions are growing at a rate superior to the inflation rate. This year, they were increased twice. And starting from June the 1st, by additional 10 percent, 
together with pensions by 10 percent. We've increased the minimum wages as well as the subsistence level to which many other social benefits and payments are tied, and they will have to increase accordingly, which is going to directly affect the better. The income of around 15 million people. Over the recent years, we have set in place a comprehensive system to support low-income families with children and women can get support from pregnancy until their children reach 17 years. The welfare of people and their well-being is an important factor of demographic development given the negative demographic waves that are overlapping in April this year. Less, fewer than 100,000 children were born. That's by 13 percent less than in April 2020. And I would like to ask the chairman of the Russian government to personally oversee the development of additional measures to support families with children. They need to be comprehensive and commensurate with the magnitude of these demographic challenges we are up against. The future of Russia lies with families with two, three, and more children. So it's not just about direct financial support. We need to target and tie to the needs of these families with children everything, the healthcare system, education system, and the rest that affects our quality of life. And this is precisely the goal pursued by the National Social Initiative, implemented by regional teams and the Agency for Strategic Initiative. Together this autumn, we are going to take stock of the standards of living to get the best practices and spread them. The fifth principle is the accelerated development of our infrastructure. We've already increased direct budget expenditure on reinforcing our transport network. And starting next year, we are going to build the main roads at the federal and regional level. Within five years, no less than 20, uh, 85 percent of these roads should be rebuilt to comply with standards. We are actively employing such a new tool as infrastructure budget loans provided for 15 years at 3 percent rate, and the demand is running far higher than initially anticipated. Our regions can boast carefully thought through promising projects which we cannot delay. We'll think what we can do. Last night, we had a lengthy discussion about that, and we think this is a very good instrument. On a particular note, we need to modernize the utilities sector, and there are many problems there. This is a chronically underfunded sector to the tune of 4.5 trillion rubles. 40% of networks have to be changed, hence low efficiency, big losses, and uh, no less than 3% of networks go into obsolescence, become dilapidated on a yearly basis, and just 2 percent are changed. And this situation is getting worse year in, year out. That's why we need to consolidate resources and launch a comprehensive program to modernize the utility sector. It should be synchronized with our plans for infrastructural development and overhaul of housing. We need to currently improve the situation, and we need to steadily bring down the share of dilapidated and obsolete networks. We should also address the issue of substandard leaving, and we'll talk about that in detail with governors during the uh, session of the Bureau of the State Council next week. I also suggest that we boost the resources to create a favorable urban environment in small towns and historical settlements. It's a good program, and we believe we need to allocate additional 10 billion rubles on a yearly basis in 2023-2024 to these ends. Additional money is going to be allocated to develop the Russian Far East. I would like to request the government to allocate special limits and set special conditions for these and under the infrastructure budget loans program and the modernization of the utilities program, our special priority is the comprehensive development of rural territories because people who live in rural areas feed the country and they need comfortable, decent living conditions. So 
I request the government in these regard to allocate additional funds for the relevant state and government program. The financial source for that can come from export fees levied on the sales of agricultural goods. It's a constant source. Yes, it can be volatile, but it's going to be on a permanent basis. So, separately, I suggest we should expand the programs for rebuilding and modernizing rural housing and cultural houses and regional theaters and museums, allocating six billion rubles for these ends in 2023-2024 of particular importance, as I said, well, I'm going to give you a, a very good example. I gave medals to heroes of uh, labor. One of them was uh, Mr. Mikhailov from Yakutia. During the closed door meetings, he asked to help with building a culture center at his settlement and will help him. But people at all levels say that this is a relevant matter. Let me digress a little bit. I think it's uh, perfectly acceptable here because the holiday season is starting in Russia. You're in, you're out. An increasing number of tourists are trying to reach the marvelous natural spots across our country in national parks and natural reserves. Our estimates say that this year the tourist flow is going to be more than 12 million people. And it's very important that government agencies, businesses, and tourists know what's acceptable, what's not, where tourist facilities can be built, and where it's categorically forbidden because it creates risks for fragile, unique ecosystems. The State Dome is currently Duma, considering a draft law which is aimed at regulating the organization of tourism and specially protected territories. We need to create a civilized foundation for such activities. And in this regard, I would like to say that all decisions taken in this domain have to be carefully thought through. They have to be considered very cautiously. On a particular note, I would like to say how important it is to preserve and protect Lake Baikal. And this is precisely the objective of our unique comprehensive development project for the city of Baikal. It should be the example of rational, environmentally friendly economic activity we need, not just to liquidate and neutralize the accumulated damage done by the Baikal paper and uh, pulp uh, factory. We need to elevate the city to a new level of life. It should be the flame bearer of Russian environmental tourism. There's Projects should be based on cutting-edge technologies and environmentally friendly energy sources. We will use clean technologies and environmentally modernize our enterprises, decrease the atmospheric pollution. We need to create circular economy projects, green projects, preserve the climate. And this is something I spoke about at this forum last year. And we also come down to the sixth cross-cutting principle of our development, which is the achievement of technological sovereignty. We need to create an integral system for economic development that is not dependent on foreign institutions. We have to build all spheres of life on a new level of technological quality. And we should not be just uh, belly users. We have to have technological keys to building goods and services of new generations. Over the recent years, we've been paying a great deal of attention to input substitutions, and we've made some great headway in agriculture, in defense, in uh, medicine, and in many other things. We've got many discussions on that. But import substitution is no silver bullet. It's no universal solution. Should we blindly emulate others? Should we try to replace these goods and services with copies, albeit with good ones? We will always be catching up, and we have to be one step ahead. We have to create our own competitive technologies, goods, and services which can set the new world standards. In this regard, I would like to remind you that Sergei Korolev chose not to blindly copy and partially improve on the trophy rockets. He saw into the future, and he came up with a unique package system when building the R-7 rocket, thereby paving the way to outer space for humanity, and he set the standards for many decades to come. 
and that was the principle of the founders of many Soviet scientific programs who looked ahead. And based on this groundwork, our researchers are trading and striding forth. Thanks to them, Russia boasts hypersonic weapons, and uh, that's unprecedented. No, uh, no other countries have that. Ross Adams still is uh, retaining the leading edge in nuclear-powered technologies and icebreakers. We have uh, cutting-edge solutions in AI and big data, the best in the world. This technological development is the cross-cutting dimension which is going to determine the future of not the, just the next 10 years, but also the 21st century. And it's in detail that we're going to talk about this techno-economics at the next session of the Soviet on strategic development. And of course, we need new managerial solutions to develop engineering, education, the transfer of scientific achievements. They have to translate into real economy. They have to be provided with financial resources. And we'll talk about the cross-cutting foundational technologies as well as the as well as about the digital transformation of whole sectors. Of course, we cannot produce everything. It's impossible, and we do not need that. But we need to have the critically important technologies. So should we require it, we should be able to set up our own protection of production of any goods or services on our own basis within a very short time frame. And this is what we do did with the coronavirus vaccine. And right now, we've done that for many other products and services. To cite an example, once the responsible partners of Kamaz left the Russian market, this niche was occupied by Russian producers. And it's not just uh, about the spare parts. Uh, there are also very good prospects for line haul, transport, and heavy trucks. I would also like to take note of the MIA payment system, which successfully re replaced Visa and MasterCard in the domestic market. It's currently steadily increasing its geographic scope, achieving international recognition. Another example, the St. Petersburg tractor plant, its foreign partner, refused to provide motors and provide technical maintenance. Instead, Yaroslavl and Tutaev motor producers fostered supply chains. And right now, in March, April, St. Petersburg tractor plant achieved record highs in production levels. And there are many other positive practices like that, and they're becoming increasingly numerous. I reiterate, Russia boasts human, scientific, and technological foundation to uh, create any products that is particularly relevant, including uh, appliances and construction and industrial and service equipment. Right now, we need to boost capacities to set up production lines within a very short time frame. And of course, we need prepared production capacities and facilities. So I instruct the government by autumn to present the key parameters for new industrial clusters. In this domain, what's important is funding. In these clusters, entrepreneurs should have access to long-term affordable loans up to 10, uh, at least 10 years, and at no more than 7% is interest rate in rubles. And we've spoken about that with the economic division of the government. Everyone agrees we'll do that. Secondly, taxation. In these clusters, the semi-fixed taxes should be at a low level, including insurance payments. The third avenue to pursue is supporting production at the earliest stages when building the package of orders, providing subsidies to get the products from these enterprises. It's going to be difficult, but I think subsidies will be required. We have to work this through. Fourth, facilitated administrative regime. There should be no schedule, uh, sh 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 no inspections or n little, very few. And the same goes for taxation and customs. Monitoring should be very light and not cumbersome. Fifth. We need to create guaranteed long-term demand for this innovative production produced and reaching the market. We need a preferential regime for these industrial clusters, and it's been, it's going to be in force starting from January the 1st, 2023. I would like to say in this regard that the new poles of growth 
and the existing one should engage small business for enterprises, for small organizations. It's important to see where you're going, to see the prospects. And that's why I would like to ask the government to work together with the SMEs Corporation as well as with our biggest companies to launch the tool of long-term contracts with uh, state-sponsored companies and small and medium enterprises because this will guarantee the demand for the goods produced by these entrepreneurs. This will help them expand their current production capacities or create new ones. We have already decreased the time frames for building industrial facilities. We have removed cumbersome procedures, but there are some margins for improvement, especially if you start from scratch. It takes from 18 months to three years. And if you want to buy ready-made industrial facilities, still the interest rates are very high. That's why I suggest we launch a new instrument, namely the industrial mortgage. I am referring to concessional long-term rates, uh, loans at 5% on a yearly basis. And these mortgage loans will be provided to enterprises who would like to buy ready-made industrial facilities for production. And I would like the government not to tarry to hammer out the details with the banking sector so that it takes up as soon as possible in a fully-fledged manner. Distinguished friends, the rate and magnitude of changes happening to the global economy, to the finance, and to the international relations are growing and increasingly pronounced as the shift from globalization in favor of a multipolar growth model. The birth of a new world order is an arduous process. We are yet to face many new challenges, risks, and factors which it is impossible to predict as of now. But it's evident that the rules, the very essence of the new world order, will be set by strong sovereign nations. Those who are not following in someone else's footsteps. Only strong nations can make a contribution to the emergence of this new nascent world order. Otherwise, they will be relegated to the status of a disenfranchised colony of someone else. They need to strive forth, listen to the voice of time, change. And for that end, they should demonstrate national will and resoluteness. Russia is entering this era as a powerful sovereign nation, we are certain to use the colossal opportunities that are currently opening up in front of us. We'll get even stronger. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, President. You have uh, given a very detailed speech. It is exhausting, and we have nothing else to talk about. However, we have questions to ask, and we'll proceed to questions later. But now I would like to invite Kasim Jomar Tokayev, president of Kazakhstan. I would like to invite you to the podium and to present your point of view on what's happening in your country, what's happening in Russia, and in the world. Distinguished Vladimir Putin, President of Russia, distinguished members of the forum, participants. I would like to congratulate you on the anniversary 25th uh, St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. I would like to thank President Putin for the invitation for a warm welcome in a cultural capital of Russia. Over 25 years, the St. Petersburg Forum has become an expert, important platform. It's one of uh, the world discussion platforms that are really important. We meet in the context, a special context of economic political turbulence uh, with global disruptions um, 
with regards to the pandemic and the geopolitical tensions. It led to a new reality. Globalization was changed by regionalization with all its advantages and uh, inherent drawbacks. Nevertheless, we see the reformation of a traditional economic um, model and trade routes. The world is rapidly changing, unfortunately, in the majority of cases, not to the better. Inflation in many countries breaks down anti-records. We see slowing growth rates of the economy. We see lower resources and investments. The economic growth is restricted by the climate change, increase in migrants flow, and uh, accelerated um, technological advances. We are paying close attention to these processes. Talking about new reality, it's important to take into account rapidly changing the world order and the change of um, well-established uh, contacts uh, between North and South, West and East. It's important for the countries of origin not only to find right answers to those challenges, but to to use them to our benefit. In this regard, we are substantively, cons consistently will tap the potential of the Eurasian Economic Union. We need to bring the Eurasian integration in line with the One Road, One Belt initiative of China. As you know, Kazakhstan is now undergoing uh, massive economic and political reforms aimed at resetting the state governance and to build a new just Kazakhstan. Our efforts are aimed at boosting economic growth and in order for it to proportionally increase uh, our people's well-being. We are aimed at sustainable development of trade and economic ties to open up new industries and to create conditions for the growth of human capital and to introduce investments. As part of a large-scale modernization of our country, we are building new rules, setting new rules of the game without monopolies uh, and outrageous corruption. Our priority is to support uh, the entrepreneurship, to improve the business climate in order to protect the rights of investors to the maximum and to improve stability and predictability. We will fully respect our commitments we given to our traditional partners. Kazakhstan will continue to pursue the construction of an inclusive, just society and will fight against social inequality. In my opinion, in order to sustainably develop all the countries of the region, it is necessary to set new horizons of cooperation and to create new ways for our economies to grow. In this regard, it's important to understand that it's crucial to ensure regional and global security. So next, I would like to draw your attention to the following. First, as I have already said, we need to strengthen the potential of the Eurasian Economic Union. This goal remains relevant for us. The aggregated um, potential of the economies of all the states is over $2 trillion. This is a huge market with a free flow of goods and services as well as labor force. In any case, that is the ideal picture. And despite geopolitical challenges and pandemic, we continue to strengthen our mutual trade. Our trade reached uh, its maximum over the entire period of uh, the Union and accounted to $73 million, which is 30 percent more than um, was recorded last year. As part of the Eurasian Economic Union, the key partner, trade and economic partner for Kazakhstan has always been Russia. Uh, the trade turnover between our countries has increased by 30 percent and reached uh, the number of 24 billion dollars. This is uh, the top, uh, this is the record for us. And this year, over the first quarter, the trade turnover increased by more than 12 percent. In my opinion, it would be suitable and useful to 
develop a new trade strategy as part of the Eurasian Economic Union that would take into account a new reality. Instead of counter sanctions that, uh, in my opinion, will not be productive, we should uh, promote, pursue a more active, even proactive, flexible trade policy that would uh, uh, be oriented towards the East and the, uh, towards Asia and the Middle East. And we can play the role of a buffer market. In general, the success, long-term success of the Eurasian integration largely depends on the effectiveness of our joint uh, trade strategy. Kazakhstan and Russia can bring industrial cooperation to a qualitatively new level. We have designed a special plan, a program of industrial cooperation in the modern conditions. Russian investors will enjoy industrial platforms with the relevant infrastructure. Uh, they will enjoy good uh, investment conditions. These steps have already been made. And in uh, the modern context, it's very important to fully tap agricultural potential of our countries. According to the FAO statistics, on the uh, surfaces of agricultural um, lands, Russia and Kazakhstan are the leaders in this list. And this fact becomes more relevant in the light of deteriorating world uh, of global food security. According to the UN, this year the number of people who face hunger will increase from 200 and from 270 to 323 million people. It's important uh, to supply the population uh, with uh, reliable food, uh, with good food and water, and this is necessary for the stability. In order for the system to work, we need innovations, uh, cross-cutting uh, cutting edge technologies, and to decrease uh, food losses. The approaches to ensuring food security should be built both on national and regional levels, including, of course, the Eurasian Economic Union, given the needs and the interests of all member states. Without uh, joint efforts, it's difficult to achieve uh, the goals set in this crucial area. In other words, uh, fighting overwhelming inflation and uh, food deficit, this is our common goal. Today and in short term, this is the most relevant goal because uh, it directly affects well-being of our citizens. Potential of Kazakhstan and Russia helps us to fully saturate our markets with the necessary food commodities, uh, which was uh, stressed by President of Russia. Secondly, I, would, I believe that it's important uh, to expand uh, a trade economic cooperation with other countries. Kazakhstan is an active part of integration processes, and we have always advocated in favor of cooperating with other international organizations. On the margins of the St. Petersburg Forum, as I know, the participants are discussing the uh, Greater Eurasian Partnership. Uh, this initiative was put forward by the Russian Federation. It is uh, designed to create a common area for uh, equal cooperation between countries and regional organizations. Therefore, we are in favor of creating a Greater Eurasian Partnership. This year, Kazakhstan is the president of the CIS. We have a successful experience um, of leading uh, this organization, and uh, the I would like to say that the multilateral instruments for multilateral dialogues are very important, and I believe that the CIS can serve as a useful platform for implementing projects such as a Greater Eurasian Partnership. At the same time, the SCO ASEAN Eurasian Economic Union can become an integral part of a greater Eurasian community. Traditionally friendly countries such as China, India, the Middle East countries, uh, South and Southeast Asia, these countries can become uh, important investors to the economies of our region. China has already become uh, the most important uh, trade and economic partner for our country. 
this country invested over 23 billion dollars over the last 15 years therefore deepening uh, bilateral and multilateral cooperation with uh, china is very important for our country political cooperation is important as well as economic aspects we need to tighten direct uh, channels between businesses to build new transport and logistics corridors. And today, I met uh, on this forum, I met Russian representatives, representatives of other interested states. We pay a specific attention to discussing these issues. It's also look, it also looks promising to create a pool of uh, cutting edge technological projects and um, reliable transport logistics chains to create new opportunities for the economic growth for both our countries. Thirdly, Kazakhstan has always stood in favor uh, of international efforts aimed at, at combating the climate change. We will give more and more way for the green investments and to the relevant projects. Environmental pro problems are global. All, almost all the countries of the world were affected, including Kazakhstan. Last year, because of uh, a drought and um, problems with uh, the river supply, water from uh, the river, we have the problems at the Zhaik region in our country. I believe that such long-term challenges must be dealt with uh, jointly. I believe that we need to think of uh, the closed loop uh, a so-called circular economy. And we are working on uh, decreasing our dependence on energy. To, we develop uh, renewable uh, sources of energy and fight against energy losses. Industrial ties between our countries and geography dictate that it is necessary for us to unite efforts in the strategically important sphere. I hope that together we can come up with reliable approaches and to identify concrete measures to achieve sustainable results. Fourth, a sustainable source of economic growth is, of course, a qualitative human capital and a constructive intercultural dialogue. As part of the international decade of uh, reapproaching of cultures declared at the UN, we will continue to make efforts to increase cultural diversity and to promote intercultural dialogue internationally. In September this year, our capital will host uh, the traditional um, meeting of uh, world religious religions. And we would like to invite uh, uh, religion personalities from Russia to take part in this forum. We are actively changing the system of higher education involving leading international universities, including Russian universities. We deepen educational ties. This is of particular importance in order to strengthen traditions of Russia-Kazakhstan cooperation. I'm confident that a successful implementation of educational cultural initiatives will help to make a significant contribution to sustainable economic development of our countries. Distinguished participants, Kazakhstan firmly believes that Eurasia is our common house and the states of our continent must closely cooperate together. We are convinced that a peaceful, stable, economically strong Eurasia will be an important factor to an inclusive global growth. We believe that this important discussion platform that uh, brings together high-level experts has a huge potential to find productive ideas aimed at normalizing the international situation and bringing back the world economy to uh, the positive dynamics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tokayev. Eurasia. Some negotiations took place. Eurasia is indeed is our common house, uh, and we would like this house to prosper thanks to our joint efforts. And now we will uh, move to Africa. We have um, a, an address by 
the president of Egypt, uh, Mr. Al-Sisi. In the name of uh, God, um, the distinguished president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, first of all, I would like to congratulate His Excellency President Putin with the anniversary forum. Since its first session in 1997, has already become an important platform for the business community to cooperate, has become an outstanding economic event, which discusses the main economic problems uh, that developing markets and the rest of the world face. Ladies and gentlemen, the Arab Republic of Egypt takes part in the 25th St. Petersburg International Economic Forum as a guest country, which attests to a, a privileged level of Russia-Egypt economic relations that has emerged over the past few years. This year, the forum is held uh, amid unprecedented uh, economic and political strategic challenges. I hope that the results of the forum will help to find effective solutions to current problems and uh, will help to overcome, to mitigate uh, the world economic crisis that hit many countries in the world, including the developing countries. At the same time, it is necessary to take into the account the concerns of all countries that will help to ensure security and well-being of peoples and help to achieve long-standing, long-term understanding on political issues. This will lay beneficial foundation for the economy, the global economy to grow it's very important in the post-COVID environment because the uh, pandemic demanded uh, us to pay to devote many financial resources and our economic development was slowed down. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity and stress that Egypt is proud that it uh, has formed relations of solid friendship with Russia. And we have uh, formed these relations over the last few years in the most important areas of economy in the interest of increasing well-being of our peoples. Over the past years, the Arab Republic of Egypt and the Russian Federation were part of uh, large ambitious projects, which attests to the aspiration of our peoples to ensure further economic progress. Maybe one of the most important projects, perhaps, is uh, the building of the Adaba nuclear power station, which is in line with the national Egyptian strategy in terms of national projects using the renewables. We can also list uh, name uh, the Russian industrial zone as part of the Suez uh, Canal uh, Economic Zone, and this project will be an important indicator of economic growth in Africa. Uh, the development of Egyptian railroads and other joint projects are important because they benefit both our countries. Ladies and gentlemen, it's well known that uh, over the past decades, Egypt lived through important historic events and it seriously uh, influenced uh, the social, p the well-being of our citizens and our people managed to overcome the crisis uh, thanks to the very concrete uh, strategy for development based on investments, first and foremost investments in human capital, in ordinary Egyptians. It helped to unlock their uh, creative potential. On this basis, Egypt developed a 20, the 2030 conception, a long-term long -term strategy to ensure social economic development and uh, environment protection. On the basis of this conception, the Egyptian government 
decided to improve and modernize the legal basis in order to attract investments. As a result, Egypt ranked first among African countries uh, that uh, uh, draw uh, the foreign investments. And Egypt has become one of the few countries in the world that reached uh, significant uh, economic growth of 3.2% uh, in 2021, despite uh, the negative uh, influence of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on the world economy. Currently, we expect our national economy to grow at a tempo of 5.5% in this financial year. Non-petroleum exports of our country raised to $32 billion. Egypt also reached uh, certain successes in implementing the strategy uh, Amitex expanding internal potential, domestic potential, and re-implementing agricultural projects by increasing uh, the agricultural areas by 2 million. And this, uh, in addition, we are implementing ambitious transport communication projects. We are building dozens of kilometers of new roads um, and develop are developing infrastructure. In this regard, uh, the high-speed train project that would connect uh, uh, the Red and the Mediterranean Sea, and it will increase uh, the world uh, trade routes. I would like also to add to this list uh, a number of industrial projects, including the projects on green energy that are being implemented uh, in um, uh, Egypt. Despite the aforementioned steps, we have recently faced the economic crisis provoked by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the whole world uh, is steadily overcoming the consequences of this crisis. At the same time, we are facing another economic crisis, which negatively affected uh, the economic growth and budgets of different countries. As a result, we've seen the growth of prices on fuel, and we saw the depreciation of national currency. It led to the disruption of uh, supply chains, um, disruptions in civil aviation and other areas of Egyptian economy. First and foremost in tourism and insurance. In order to overcome this global crisis, we need to unite our efforts to coordinate our steps in order to normalize the situation. In particular, it's important for the naval navigation, for restoring food supplies, uh, grain, oils. We need to stabilize the global situation to reduce the consequences of economic crisis for those people who strive peace and development. I would like to take this opportunity and to call on all the companies that are part of this forum to tap the huge potential and to invest in all the spheres, uh, in, uh, in the, all the areas of uh, economy in, in Egypt. I would like to send best regards to the citizens of uh, citizens of St. Petersburg, the city of wrestlers who are uh, very important for the city and uh, that city is uh, the symbol of openness to the entire world. I would like to thank in conclusion His Excellency President Putin for his invitation that he sent to Egypt to take part in this forum as a guest country. I would like to wish the participants uh, all the success to all the brotherly nations. I would like to wish constructive, successful cooperation, prosperity, and progress. I pray to the God to send us peace and stability, to prevent wars, to avoid social economic uh, consequences of conflicts, to resort to dialogue, to the language of mutual understanding, and peaceful coexistence. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, 
Mr. President, I'm sure all the residents of St. Petersburg are particularly pleased to hear those warm words addressed to them. Well, we have a little way to go before we move over to the discussion and we tempt you a little bit longer. Before that, we'd like to listen to the address by the President of the People's Republic of China, President Xi Jinping. Your Excellency President Vladimir Putin, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I want to thank President Putin for his kind invitation. It gives me great pleasure to join you again at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum after three years. In February, President Putin visited China and attended the opening ceremony of the Beijing Winter Olympics. We had friendly exchanges and reached many important common understandings on expanding all-round bilateral practical cooperation and following a global governance philosophy that emphasizes extensive consultations, joint contribution and shared benefits. Currently, China-Russia cooperation is showing good momentum across the board. Two-way trade reached 65.8 billion US dollars in the first five months of this year and is expected to reach a new high for the whole year. This reflects the strong resilience and internal impetus of our bilateral cooperation. As a result of major changes and the pandemic, both unseen in the century, the world is entering a new phase of instability and transformation. Economic globalization is facing headwinds. The north-south gap keeps widening and development cooperation is losing steam. All these are weighing down the already struggling world economy and posing unprecedented challenges to the implementation of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. As an ancient Chinese uh, dictum goes, a wise man would always think about potential risks in a favorable situation and look for possible opportunities in times of adversity. Crises and opportunities come together and a crisis overcome is an opportunity gained. For a crisis to be turned into an opportunity, confidence is the game changer. The more difficult things get, the greater the need grows to stay confident. Last year, I proposed the Global Development Initiative at the UN General Assembly. It has seen been warmly received and supported by the UN and other international organizations and some 100 countries in the world, at a time when the international community is so keen about achieving more equitable, sustainable and secure development, we should seize opportunities, meet challenges head on and work on the implementation of the GDI to build a shared future of peace and prosperity. First, we need to foster an enabling environment for development. It is important that we follow true multilateralism, respect and support all countries' pursuit of development paths suited to their national conditions, build an open world economy and increase the representation and voice of emerging markets and developing countries in global economic governance, with a view to making global development more balanced, coordinated and inclusive. Secondly, we need to strengthen development partnerships. It is important that we enhance North-South and South-South cooperation, pool cooperation resources, platforms and networks of development partnerships and scale up development assistance in order to forge greater synergy for development and close the development gap. Third, we need to advance economic globalization. It is important that we strengthen soft connectivity of development policies and international rules and standards, reject attempts at decoupling supply disruption, unilateral sanctions and maximum pressure, remove trade barriers, keep global industrial and supply chains stable, tackle the worsening food and energy crises and revive the world economy. 
Fourth, we need to pursue innovation-driven development. It is important that we unlock the potential of innovation-driven growth, improve the rules and institutional environment for innovation, break down barriers to the flow of innovation factors, deepen exchanges and cooperation on innovation, facilitate deeper integration of science and technology into the economy and make sure the fruits of innovations are shared by all. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the fundamentals of the Chinese economy, its strong resilience, enormous potential and long-term sustainability remain unchanged. We have full confidence in China's economic development. China will continue to promote high-quality development, expand high standard opening up with firm resolve and pursue high-quality Belt and Road cooperation. China stands ready to work with Russia and all other countries to explore development prospects, share growth opportunities, and make new contributions to deepening global development cooperation and building a community with a shared future for the mankind. Thank you all. Our gratitude go to presidency. It is always exciting to learn more about the Chinese wisdom, learn a few new Chinese sayings. Probably, who knows, the Chinese wisdom is exactly what the world needs at the moment. President Putin, I wanted to show one thing. I wanted to show it specifically to you. That's a package of uh, juice. It doesn't really matter what kind of juice it is or what brand it is, but look at the packaging. It used to be very different. It looked very colorful. Now it's all white. Why so? Well, because there is no paint available. The manufacturer of paint for that type of packaging uh, has left the Russian market, and now we have heard that even the manufacturer of the packaging itself is about to leave Russia as well. So even that will no longer be available, so that would probably mean that we would have to bottle juice uh, to put it into glass bottles as it used to be when I was a child. So there are very different positions on that. You slightly touched on the matter in your address today. A major part of the people present in this hall at the moment have probably arrived to St. Petersburg on a Subsun train. We hear from some people that will replace Subsun trains by the Chinese trains that are even better. Some say that we will learn to manufacture trains on our own. Well, I have to say that the high-speed trains we used to have in 1984, they were called R24, was aged four at the moment, and back then we had high-speed trains, but we no longer have them, which is quite sad. And there are people who say that, no, we cannot substitute Subsun trains. They will operate for about two more years, and then we'll have to make a step back, and we'll have to refuse from high-speed transportation. And that will happen everywhere, mobile phones, computers, everything that we're used for. And we will have to refuse from that. That would be extremely sad, uh, really heartbreaking, I would say. Is there any other option? Well, whenever a decision is being made, any decision, you have to focus on the essentials. What are the essentials today? Our independence, our sovereignty, and ensure our development in the future? now and for future generations or have a nice uh, package today. Well, if we don't have our sovereignty today, then in some not far away future, we will have to procure everything and we would only produce oil, gas, uh, horse saddles maybe as we used to do it in the past and sell timber abroad. Well, that would be inevitable, and this is exactly what I was talking about in my presentation. Only sovereign countries can count on independence in the future. But it does not mean that we should step back and turn back the time to 30 or 40 years. Well, as for packaging issue, I do not think that it is so extremely complicated and it's not something that we could substitute either with the help of our partners from other countries who would be delighted to occupy this niche or maybe it's something that we could do on our own. 
Well, I see President Tokayev nodding his head, so most probably they are ready to uh, jump at this opportunity. I'm sure they are, but that's not uh, the point of the matter. We talk about import substitution a lot. Well, I would only add a few words on that. I don't want to take too much time. Time. I will just answer this question. It's not about import substitution as such. It is important to create our own opportunities based on development of education, science, new and promising engineering schools, be that packaging or any other things, even smartphones. Well, we can always buy it, but what we could never get, and that was never the case, are those critically important technologies. We could never get those, even before, despite all the perfect relations we used to enjoy with our Western partners in the previous decade, and that is the problem. And whenever we want to protect our rights, we see sanctions being imposed and limitations, and that is the problem. That is why uh, that's exactly the spirit that we should use now, the ability to produce critically important technologies based on what we have. If we have this solid foundation, we will always be able to produce and manufacture all the products that you mentioned, smartphones, packaging, everything. So if we really understand it and if we focus on resolving fundamental matters, then all the associated uh, problems would be easily resolved. Once again, there will always be other partners willing to take the niche, and they are doing it already. Manufacturers of packaging, paint and lacquers, we're doing it already. And any other staple goods or products related to industrial applications, we can do it all. I have no doubt at all. Yes, some things would get lost, some would be recovered, something would be done on a new base in a much more advanced manner, just like as it always was. So if we talk about some import substitution, some things will be substituted, some things have to be built and developed in a new way on our own production base. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President, would you like to add something? Well, I guess it does not require any further clarifications, really. And judging from a very interesting address by President Putin, I guess we can clearly see that already now he is thinking strategically, uh, just as always. Exactly. And uh, it's not really time to care about a package of Jews. And indeed, if there is an exciting and lucrative business, it will always be taken and there will always be partners to come and replace the other ones. There will be new packages of Jews, I can assure you. New entrepreneurs will come up. We are talking today about something much more important, and this is what I focused on in my address, the importance of Eurasian cooperation, the importance of uniting our efforts. We have faced problems we could not expect, and I guess along this way, we will succeed. Thank you very much. And I wanted to ask you about Eurasian Economic Union. You addressed the necessity to strengthen cooperation in Eurasian space. We all agree, but will we be allowed to strengthen this partnership? Clearly, Russia, well, how should I put it softly? Well. Uh, Russia is no longer caring to pay attention to somebody else's criticism or pressure. That was never the case. But there are other member countries. I'm sure your country and maybe even you personally are feeling this pressure. We can only guess. Maybe you would let us know more about it. But some other countries are being threatened by secondary sanctions. Will we be able to do that? Take into account the factor of pressure. Not the goodwill we have. We have it. But those uh, threats. As for Kazakhstan, I would not say that there is direct pressure being imposed in our country. Well, it is a matter of negotiations. Sanctions do exist, and we are taking those sanctions into account in our economic and trade strategy. But at the same time, there are obligations that Kazakhstan has 
We are bound by the early agreements we have with the Russian Federation. And as I mentioned in my speech, the geography itself, not to mention the history, means that we are to be together, work together in some very specific conditions. I have mentioned availability of a special industrial cooperation program between our countries. So we are going to work on that. And I assume that the Eurasian Economic Union, despite all the difficulties, has a bright future ahead of it. And the member countries that have joined the Union together comprise a meaningful economic force, big economic potential. Well, one cannot rush ahead, and I certainly do not want to criticize anyone at all, because the actual difficulties and hurdles do exist. That is objective reality of today. And therefore, we need negotiations, and that is exactly at the core of the work that lies ahead of us. That is a very challenging exercise. We need to find mutually acceptable solutions, uh, to take into account the interests of one another. Yes, we do have arguments within the Eurasian Economic Union. We do not only meet in an open format. We do have behind-the-door uh, meetings as well. And I see President Putin smiling at that. Yeah, but we always find a solution, and that gives us reason for optimism. Thank you very much. I wish us all uh, the best of luck in uh, searching those solutions. Thank you. My colleague just mentioned that sometimes we do have arguments. We always have arguments. We always have disagreements. But we always demonstrate respect towards one another, and we will search and find compromises. You mentioned pressure from the outside. Well, we've just heard the speech by President Tokayev, and he mentioned the volume of our trade. Well, despite all the pressures, you cannot just uh, cancel the amount of trade. $24 billion is uh, the volume of trade for the previous year, and it's $12.5 billion for the few months of this year. And it will only be bigger. It will get close to 40 at the end of the year, probably. So this is something you can't cancel. It exists, and uh, hundreds of thousands of workplaces are dependent on that, and the well-being of millions of people. It's just like if, if you try and cancel or anything. Well, they try to impose sanctions on Russian fertilizers, but then they revert to their decision because everybody needs something to eat and sanctions can change this. And an attempt to make a, a blitzkrieg against Russian economy. Well, clearly they failed, as Mark Twain was saying, the room of my death are strongly exaggerated. Well, the same applies here. As for Eurasian Economic Union, the uh, volume of trade with all our countries is constantly growing, and it is growing stronger as if we compare growth in the turnover volume with the third countries. And nonetheless, it does not stop the member countries from developing trade with the third countries, and that is exactly how it should be. It's very good. My colleague also mentioned investment from China, but I have to say that uh, Russian investment into Kazakhstan is seven billion, but uh, there is twenty billion coming from China. That's uh, clearly more. Well, they have one point five billion people uh, living in China and only forty six in Russia. Well, there is a difference, but again, seven billion invested in a very specific production facilities in Kazakhstan are, I guess, meaningful. And we have quite an intensive program of industrial cooperation, which is important. And it's not just the cooperation we've been having with the Eurasian Economic Union, but those are also newly developing projects. You can't cancel that. You can't ban it, no matter how much you'd like that. 
So problems are being created, but I'm confident that we will overcome them. Just as a follow-up on your comment that everybody uh, is hungry and everybody needs food, well, you could hear a slogan somewhere around Moscow, like, all we can hope for is hunger. What is meant by that is that, well, here comes hunger, and that's when our partners will come to their mind and will cancel sanctions because they will realize that they have to be friends with us. Do you think that that is a realistic forecast? I really wouldn't want the hunger to be the reason, but still. As I mentioned in my speech, the situation in the global food markets is deteriorating. And again, I want to emphasize it's not our fault. Definitely not. It all started with the uh, skyrocketing inflation and pumping money supply and money printing by the leading economies in the European Union and uh, North America. They created this problem. And of course, they made things even worse uh, with sanctions imposed against Russia, primarily the logistical problems, financial services, insurance, but we certainly wouldn't want anyone to suffer from hunger because of that. I've lately was meeting the representatives of the African Union. I told them and I want to assure them once again we're going to do everything possible on our side to take care of the interest of our regular buyers of grain. And by the way, lately we've been supplying grain to Kazakhstan as well. And we intend to do it this year as well. I've already mentioned this number, 50 million tons of grain we're going to have uh, this year. That is a serious volume. We are still leading in uh, volumes of sales of grain at the moment. We are number one in sales of grain in the world. But again, we are not happy at all and we are not taking joy in any kind of negative consequences that might follow. We really hope that uh, finally our partners will come to their common sense and the situation will come down and everyone will start treating interests of their partners with respect and will function normally. And I have no doubt that time will pass and many of our partners from at least European countries will come back to the Russian market and will keep doing business here. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Life will force them to do that, and we will not stand in their way. We are open to the world. But they have to realize that you need to treat other people with respect. Um, I hope so. We were warmly welcomed by the president of China, and there are different opinions on China among experts uh, on the region. One say that uh, some experts say that China is being careful that it will not extend a helping hand to us because it can damage uh, their interests. As an example, they say that Huawei shops are being closed in Russia. Others say that cooperation with Moscow corresponds to the core Chinese interests. Because the world uh, with uh, much weakened Russia gives uh, less hope to China uh, to hope for a multipolar world. In your opinion, what do you see? What will be with picture the picture with China? And what is the situation? You know that multipolarity is not a preferred scenario. It is inevitable. And when we hear that some try to freeze the international relations uh, at the example of 30 years old when the 30 years ago when um, the USSR collapsed but people understand that uh, the changes are inevitable we see a more dynamic uh, polaris um, of power and many people don't like it and many people don't like uh, seeing the growth of chinese might I highlight that uh, the economy on uh, PPP is uh, China is number one on in this regard, and this is a fact. And GDP per capita is much lower in China than in the United States and Europe. But uh, 
taken into account the economy as a whole, China is number one. And given the growth tempos of China, it means that China can allocate massive resources to development, to culture, education, science. It's, this is very important, and this creates prospects for the development. The same applies to India, with a population of about 1.5 billion people, market economy, it has been dynamically developing. Uh, Prime Minister Modi is a very uh, progressive man, a very smart man. Take, for example, Indonesia, with a population of 300 million people. Uh, this is the largest uh, country with the largest share of Muslim population. It's also developing. Africa has been developing. Latin America has been developing. Yes, these regions have their problems, but everyone has problems. Uh, but the potential is colossal, and it cannot be disregarded. The multipolar world is inevitable. And those who try to desperately preserve the unipolar world, they are making a terrible mistake that will be very costly to them. I have no doubt about it. It is not a threat. It's just a matter of life. This is a fact. As for the People's Republic of China and our relations with uh, China and Asian countries, we have started uh, intensifying our cooperation not recently, but we have been doing it because Asia and China are the new centers for global development. Everyone understands it. Everyone sees it. Take a look at the GDP growth in China. Yes, it used to be 7 plus percent. Now it's 5 percent. It was inevitable, this drop, but they are clearly leaders in this regard. The GDP growth in the United States was around 1.7 percent GDP, if I'm not mistaken. In the Eurozone, it was even lower. In Asia, the number was 5 percent or even more. So these are the global trends. And we are building our relations in line with these trends. We have been doing this for many years. Our trade turnover is $140 billion. And um, this year we'll see a record high number in terms of trade turnover, not because the current political situation forces us to do it, but it's about an objective global picture. We are interested in cooperating with China. It is beneficial to co cooperate with China, given that bilaterally we have very good trustful relations and personal friendly relations with uh, President Xi. And it uh, lays a um, good foundation for building interstate relations. However, it doesn't mean that China has to play up to everything we do, has to follow us in every endeavor. We don't need it. We understand that China has national interests, and we understand that, as we do, the Chinese leadership is guided, first and foremost, by their national interests. But our national interests do not contradict each other. And if we have some arguments, um, uh, and of course there are some issues that we do not share opinion on completely, but uh, on an interagency level, we always find solutions. And I'm confident that it will be the case in the future. You have just said, and you have been saying this over many years, about the entrepreneurial liberties, liberties for doing business. And you are saying that this is the way forward for us, the way to development. This will be key in um, overcoming these colossal sanctions that were destined to destroy us. And the president of Kazakhstan, Mr. Takayev, has recently said, I quote, in a new just Kazakhstan, there must be no room for uh, corrupted um, judges and law enforcers, end of quote. I don't know what is the situation in Kazakhstan now, but uh, Mr. Putin, I regret to, I, I'm afraid that I will uh, disappoint you, but the situation in Russia in this regard with corruption is somewhat deplorable because the number of um, people sent uh, to 
uh, free trial detention centers, uh, the number of businessmen sent there is, uh, remains the same. So you know that in America uh, there is a deep state. We have an anti-state uh, that doesn't listen to you and doesn't uh, respect uh, uh, the current legislation. This is deplorable. Maybe we can uh, adopt a tougher stance on it, for example, uh, to put it into, uh, to enshrine it into our legislation to forbid those uh, people being sent uh, to the pretrial detention centers. I think that those people who are sent there, they are less harmful than the system itself because uh, the system protects the interests of uh, some unscrupulous people. This is a very sensitive matter. I have already mentioned it, and um, you have been speaking on behalf in the interests of uh, uh, businessmen. I understand these concerns. This what I was talking about. This was the reason why I was talking about it. But there is the other side of the medal, the interests of people, of ordinary citizens. And if they see that uh, if uh, there are illegal violations, uh, the violations of the law uh, with regards to businessmen. Then ordinary people think that uh, they ask themselves a question, why aren't state protecting us? So the situation is not easy here. You have just mentioned um, the fact that we are facing pressure. Uh, but let's go back to realities. Our neighbors also face such a pressure. Our partners saw uh, their property being taken away. Uh, they were punished uh, for working in Russia. Where are those principles of inviolability of uh, private assets? Sanctions hit hard against uh, people who have absolutely nothing to do with uh, the state, have absolutely nothing to do with the decision making. Those are the physical persons who were working in good faith and they didn't violate uh, any legislation, not uh, in Russia, neither in um, other states. This goes beyond uh, uh, every single rule. This is insane. And many people who, who were part of the Western economies, uh, they, uh, they were in favor of developing relations. But then when they were taken everything, when they saw their assets being taken, uh, they were really offended. And in 2014, you said that they will feel the consequences. Unfortunately, this was the case. But there is nothing like that in our country. Yes, uh, there are problems. Otherwise, I wouldn't have raised this topic. And facing today's difficulties uh, with regards to the pressure from the outside, I constantly repeat, we can respond effectively only by increasing liberties uh, of our ordinary citizens. And it applies to the law enforcers also. The law enforcers need to be improved. Their actions need to be improved. The number of uh, criminal cases that were not brought to court, uh, this is a problem. It means uh, that uh, these criminal cases were initiated in order to apply pressure against uh, pers some personalities. So, the, But most important here is not to turn a blind eye to it and hide away from it. But we instead, without um, violating uh, the interest of society, we will try to improve the law enforcement. We will try to make it work to the benefit of the society. And we would like to help the businessmen who saw their patriotism, who are working effectively. And those packages will be manufactured uh, by uh, the businessmen of Russia. Um, we understand it, and we will do everything uh, that depends on us in order to support those people. And we will improve uh, the law enforcers' actions. Of course, there are unscrupulous people working there. 
take a look at uh, the number of uh, people who are being sent to prison and who were former law enforcers. Uh, we, the number is uh, quite big, and we are working on um, sending to prison every unscrupulous person there. And so we're trying to improve the system so not to have uh, to have as uh, less outside pressure as possible. We understand it, and we're working working consistently in this regard. As for Kazakhstan, we have discussed these issues uh, with uh, the incumbent president for a number of times. He pays attention to fighting corruption. On IT. Many specialists, I would like to mention, they go to Kazakhstan because Kazakhstan has created good conditions and we will follow the example of Kazakhstan and we'll bring them back. Uh, thank you very much for complimenting our country. Indeed, we are creating the best possible conditions for our Russian colleagues and friends to work in Kazakhstan. I understand that uh, their relocation may not be permanent and uh, they may come back to Russia at some point. But in th at this, we need to also to cooperate and we need to screen off those people who decided. Uh, and it, it is impossible to uh, screen off those people who want to uh, work in our country. As for the law enforcement agencies reform, I understand with uh, I concur that this problem is very difficult to resolve and this problem cannot be resolved in a blink of an eye because people but it, this problem needs to be resolved because people see the problem and it leads to social depression therefore I established a special commission on returning state assets that were illegally privatized with the use of administrative political resources. Apart from that, I established a commission headed by the prosecutor general that will be in charge of uh, returning financial assets that were illegally transferred abroad. I understand that this is a difficult task because we'll have to work in line with a lot of procedures, but uh, this has to be done. As for the law enforcement agencies reform, in September I will um, declare a new package of reforms aimed at changing the format of um, the judicial system. This is a very relevant problem for Kazakhstan in particular. Now we are pursuing police reform. Yes, we are facing some difficulties in this regard. Nevertheless, I believe that in the long run we will be successful. What we need, what is crucial, is the political will and the support from our citizens. If our citizens, if our society demand this reform, if they support this reform, I believe that in the end we will be successful. Those models that existed before they justified their existence in the past. But now we need new approaches. We had some problems uh, in the law enforcement and we changed approaches. Uh, we were guided by Europe and loosened the restrictions. Then we went back to stri strictening the restrictions. Where are you moving now? In what directions? And now we found the, this golden mean and that it clearly is based on the needs of our people who want to see policemen as a reliable protection, uh, those people who are immune to corruption. Don't get me wrong, I am not going to state uh, noble goals, to set out noble goals and then to forget about it. We need to work on it. As for China, President Putin uh, has uh, told a lot of interesting things about this uh, uh, country and uh, I am a specialist on China, a uh, specialist on China by education and I concur to the thought expressed by uh, President uh, Xi Jinping.
saying that every danger has an opportunity and every opportunity is a chance to grab it. I understand that uh, a crisis is comprised of two hieroglyphs, danger and an opportunity. Every crisis has opportunities and dangers, and we need to grasp those opportunities. You mentioned the Huawei company. I spent almost eight years in China, and I had the opportunity to visit this company at the very outset in the Hansen region. I remember very well when this um, uh, company was stationed in, um, was based in a three-room apartment, and at that time, nobody thought that it will become global. But it happened. Uh, the key to the Chinese success is the fact that Deng Xiaoping managed to, to build a concept, economic concept. He reunited capitalism with a social foundation. He said that it was a, a Chinese-specific socialism. And uh, it was China who understood uh, the importance of uh, modern technologies. And they did it step by step. First of all, they produced um, essentials, sold them abroad, brought money to China, invested those uh, funds uh, in buying technologies, uh, procured technologies from abroad, as was said by the former U.S. President Donald Trump. But uh, in fact, China reached uh, many successes in technology, and uh, they set out on a way to turn China into a cyber power. So this is the key to success, the right strategy. Well, see, you talk to us about the importance of protecting entrepreneurs, right? Well, actually, you address this matter, President Putin. Yeah, all right. Uh, my colleague from Kazakhstan uh, addressed the matter of uh, assets recovery and especially the capitals that were brought out of the country illegally and now you don't know how to bring them back to the country. Well, in Russia, many entrepreneurs, many businessmen took money away abroad legally, but this money was taken away from them. They were ripped off their money. That's exactly what I'm talking about to you now. You make sure you invest here at home and we will take care of your investment. This is exactly what we're going to focus on. Well, I remember you once uh, told it to all Polish colleagues, all you have to think about is about your home. And President Putin, when you're saying that it's somewhat better out there, better abroad, well, you have to be a complete idiot or a, a moron, really, a hypocrite to believe that the West lives the values that it has been feeding to us as the only truth the right of speech, uh, right of property. I'm saying that as the editor-in-chief of RT that they closed in a day and now they um, approved the extradition of uh, Julian Assange that will be put to prison for 175 years. He is to die in prison. It's very difficult for me to say it. He was a former employee of ours. He had a program and he's an outstanding journalist and he will be put to prison for the work he's been doing as a journalist. So what kind of property right can we talk about when we see that happening? It is exactly not what we believed in in the 90s, but we're not there. We are here. So coming to this matter, I'd like to ask you about the administrative guillotine. You probably remember that uh, the government present presided by Medvedev launched this process, but we still don't really have it. And uh, those rules and regulations that many agencies are guarded by whenever they come with their inspections and audits were written back in the uh, 70s and the 60s, and they are totally outdated and are really difficult to comply with. Technically, it is virtually impossible. Maybe they were up to date back then. They protected consumer rights, which is, of course, important. You have to control what's happening, otherwise we would end up in uh, fire safety being violated everywhere and would see even more tragedies of business offices and shopping malls burning 
down and people dying. So you really act as a surgeon very specifically, very carefully, and I'm confident that you will take care of it properly. Just to cite an example, we have been through 33 inspections last year, despite all the moratoriums, and the things that they're willing to check, well, you don't know whether you should laugh at it or cry. I just don't know how they come up with this idea. Well, if there would be no the administrative uh, guillotine that um, Mr. Medvedev was talking about when he was a president, you wouldn't have 33 inspection, you would have 133. Well, I'm ready to believe it. Yeah, so I would still say that this guillotine is working. Uh, there are hundreds of outdated rules and regulations that have been cancelled and are, are no longer valid. And I'm confident that if we would give uh, the representatives of the agencies uh, present here in the room to have a word and that I'm sure that they could confirm my words. But at the same time, many would agree to what you are saying. Indeed, not enough is done there, and that's exactly what I'm saying. We need to cancel all the audits and examinations that are not really needed, all those inspections that are not necessary. So all those inspecting bodies should only come and check when there is a risk posed to life and health and when well-being of people. Otherwise, it could be uh, controlled and um, monitored remotely without any interferences. It is all doable. So, of course, a lot has been done already along this track, but we're not going to stop at that. We will continue this work. Thank you. The whole world was waiting for our economy to be shredded to pieces. Well, not the whole world, actually just one part of the world and not the biggest one. And just to remind you, 83% of population live in the countries that support Russia or at least are not joining the sanctions regime. So they didn't see our economy uh, being torn to pieces. Our economy is made of a much stronger fabrics. You can't tear it apart that easily. And we've seen a government reacting very quickly. Well, I've been criticizing uh, the government for the administrative guillotine, but I can't buy but praise the government for a very fast response on the very first days. One could not possibly imagine that we wouldn't face the huge leap of inflation that we could have, that the uh, dollar would not reach uh, 200. Uh, rubles and uh, that the uh, aviation would be at a halt. So with God's help, we think that we are really at the threshold of possible in a good sense because we acted really quickly, as quickly as we could, and we can't blame the government for being slow. But the question is, maybe it is time to uh, review the whole system. It was really interesting to hear you say that we need not just import substitution, we need to do something new so that they are trying to keep up with us. That applies to technology, if I understood you correctly, to the industry, maybe the same could be applied to the economic model as such. Well, we've heard about market economy a lot, about capitalism, but now we start seeing it differently. Today at uh, the Avnish Economic Bank session, it was mentioned that capitalism has outlived itself. It's all about trade and uh, making money. Maybe entrepreneurs should see their role differently, the place they leave, their home. They have to treat it differently and try to make it better and probably uh, there should be more interferences in economic processes. Elon Musk could never be Elon Musk if he was just an entrepreneur. He is living on from um, the orders from Pentagon. Uh, you could also say that BBC is an independent broadcaster. Well, uh, I could argue that. So maybe uh, the government should support economic activity in a way to create new economic models. What do you think about it? Well, I've addressed this matter publicly at one of the online events we've had. I was saying that the earlier models of uh, capitalism have somewhat outlived themselves when you only focus on making profits. And the world is moving to a stage of development when it is important and everyone is actually forced to think about something bigger. If we keep going this way, then the world will be totally out of balance and the threats are becoming imminent. And that is the challenge of the time. And if we want to preserve this fragile balance, we need some kind of rebalancing. And we need to take into account all 
the factors that violate this balance. The same applies um, to matters of food security, a shortage of fertilizers. How can you do it otherwise if you act like this, if uh, the major economies of the world would act like vacuum cleaners, sucking in all the products available in uh, other countries by bringing them home, well, the problems would only grow because of that. What would be the outcome? Not just hunger. Those would mean new waves of migration and those migration flows that are already um, present in the United States coming like tsunami. They've been talking about building a wave, a, a wall on a border to Mexico. Well, those flows of migrants are still there. The former and the current president might argue as long as they want, but the migrants are coming. God forbid if hunger happens in Africa, then the economic migration would only come to Europe. How are you going to react to that? Well, very simple. You simply have to stop acting like this when you only think about yourself. If they go on like this, the uh, consequences would be severe. We need to move on to other type of model of doing business and regulation. That is a difficult process, but I think it is inevitable that the global community will come to this idea. As for us, like I said, we are in this paradigm, in this global trend, and we primarily need to focus on what my colleague was talking about, uh, the president of Kazakhstan. We need to first and foremost focus on the matters of economic growth driven by technological development, new management models for the economy and a social and politic affair, political affairs. This is the only way for us to ensure leadership. This is where we have our competences. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Mr. Takayev. I'd like to ask you, do you think that that kind of imminent changes are likely to happen to the global economic models? Do you really think that they are inevitable? Well, I would say uh, life dictates this necessity today. But on the other hand, I would agree to what President Putin said about inevitability. And I also agree that there is no need for self-isolation. I am a strong supporter of international cooperation, both political, uh, even more so cooperation in the area of investment, economics, if you fail to do it in one area, you have to switch over to another one. The world is like this today. If you only want to focus on your own strength, you won't go far. Import substitution in a pure form can't exist. You need to actively search for opportunities at other markets. You need to interact with your partners. And coming back to China, China plays a vital role for Kazakhstan as a market. We have a shared border that brings us together. It is more than 4,000 kilometers in length. Everything produced in Kazakhstan, be that commodity or consumer products, chocolate, oil, plant oil, sunflower oil, it has a very high demand and finds it consumers in the Chinese market. And we trust our relationships with China. It is a very reliable partner, no matter what people say. Who says anything bad about China? Well, you know that better than I do. So in terms of regional cooperation, and even more so global aspects of it, have to stay. We are against self-isolation. We need to work with one another. Of course, now it's very difficult to survive on your own. Certainly, Russia has much greater opportunities because the economy is relatively large. The country is large. We have less opportunities. I have to be open on that. Although the potential of the Kazakhstan economy is extensive, in the Central Asia, our economy is bigger than the economies 
of other Central Asian countries combined. But we, we don't want to be too helpful here. We want to remain in shape, and we are always on alert because one thing is to achieve success, but it's something very different if you lose everything you've conquered, and that can be done very quickly. All the strengths you've gained can get lost. So under the circumstances of global competition, we have to stay in good shape, and that's exactly what we're focused on. Thank you very much. Now let's move on to another topic. Inevitably, we have to talk about Ukraine. I guess no discussion can happen today without addressing this matter. But before I ask my question, I'd like to make use of this opportunity and I'd like to remind you, if I may, that we've met a year ago with you and the representatives of the Russian media. We just got back from Donetsk with our colleagues and we were very affected by this trip. And we asked you whether Russia has any plans to support those deeply troubled people. They looked at us with hopes in their eyes. They had n nobody else to hope for. and. We, uh, it felt very difficult emotionally. We had a lot of compassion and sympathy for them. And you told me back then, well, don't worry, Margarita, we are not quitting on Donbass. And many people, well, luckily not that many. There are some people who are saying that they are ashamed of being Russian, ashamed of coming from Russia. Well, back then we felt ashamed. Now we are ashamed no longer. We can be worried, concerned, not because of the sanctions. I'm sure we'll overcome sanctions. We are concerned because people are dying, but we are ashamed no longer. And on behalf of my colleagues and millions of people who share my feelings, I would like to thank you. Well, see, the audience is sharing my sentiment. Nobody asked them to clap and to applaud. Well, thank you for that, dear audience. Now, my question, we all know what the majority of people are afraid of in our country due to this situation. That is exactly what other people on the liberated territories are worried about. People are afraid that we are going to leave them alone. We're going to quit. We aren't going to quit, are we? Well, uh, the first part of your question, if I may, first. You mentioned that some people say that they are ashamed of being Russian. Well, only those are ashamed who do not see their destiny tied, uh, lives of their children tied to our country. They're not just ashamed. They simply do not want to encounter any trouble in those regions of the world where they want to live or want their children to grow. Well, those are exactly the people who are worried. And people who think, people who see their destiny tied to Russia, well, maybe they are concerned by what is happening. Maybe they are worried. But deep in the heart, they are definitely very much interested in Russia growing stronger. Uh, more independent, more sovereign, more confident in its own future. It can't be seen in any other way if you want your children uh, to grow here and to live here. So we shouldn't really talk about shame here. It's something different. Now, as for what is happening, well, military action is always a tragedy. but. We were forced to do that. It was inevitable. We were forced to act in this manner. We were forced to do that. We were really pulled to this line. And look how it all happened. No matter what kind of pro-Western governments are there in Ukraine, we worked all right with all of them. Uh, President Yushchenko, Madam Timoshenko, they were completely pro-West. And the so-called civilizational choice. What 
what kind of a choice is that? They have stolen money from Ukrainian people, have hidden the money in the banks, and now they're saying that they want to protect Ukrainian people. And the best pretense for doing that is to say that that's civilizational choice. And now they've started doing anti-Russian policy, hoping that no matter what they do, their money is safe there. Well, that is exactly what is happening. Look what they do. No matter what they do, it it's okay. They're not punished for that. And that's exactly the point of this so-called civilizational choice. Why create uh, this upheaval and coup in uh, 2014? Well, look, three ministers of foreign affairs from three European countries, Germany, France and Poland, came to Ukraine. They were present as uh, guarantors of uh, agreement reached between uh, President Yanukovych and the opposition. I received a call from President Obama. Let us make sure that the situation calms down. All right. And in a day, uh, there is an upheaval. There is a coup happening in the country. Why? Why do that? Uh, the opposition would come to power in a democratic way. Why not do it this way? Go to the elections, um, volunteer and win the elections. Why uh, create all this bloody mess, this upheaval? And now they're saying, well, we shouldn't remember that. Oh, no, we will always remember because that is the root cause. The reason for what happened are those people who made this upheaval, this coup, and they signed a paper of agreement between President Yanukovych and the opposition. What have they done? They've created a coup. They've promised a peaceful process. What were they supposed to do? They were supposed to come and say, no, it can't work this way, guys. You have to come back to a proper political process. We need elections. And that would be it. No, they started giving a cookies uh, to uh, the protesters and supporting this coup. Why? And hence what was happening in Crimea. No, they didn't want to respect the choice of the Crimean citizens. And then the first sanctions were slapped on Russia. Twice, thrice, there were big-scale operations in Donbass, firing on people. No one blinked a better than I. Then the Kyiv authorities decided to renege on the Minsk agreements, but they were okay with that once again. That's where it all has come from. Moreover, they started to build an anti-Russian springboard in Ukraine. Imagine we were trying to build something like that somewhere next to the U.S. border, somewhere in Mexico. No one is even thinking of doing anything similar next to the U.S. In the past, we even removed our military bases from Cuba. No one would ever entertain such a thought, such an idea, whereas they do exactly the same to us. Thousands and thousands of times, hundreds of times, we were saying, let's come to an agreement, but no, they wouldn't do that. Where does this disrespectful, negligent attitude towards everyone, us included, comes? come well uh, it comes from the sense of their own magnificent magnificence which appeared after the uh, collapse of the soviet union i already said what we are gonna do we are going to protect the interests of these people our guys are fighting there they're giving their lives but there's no other way otherwise why these sacrifices. Of course, we're going to support people who live in these territories. But in the end, it is going to be up to the people who live there, who reside there, who are going to make a choice about their future, and we will respect that choice. Thank you. Well, truly, as you're probably aware, this special operation, well, amazingly to normal people, in quite in an unsurprising manner and to others uh, who are against us in a surprising manner. Uh, this special operation has consol consolidated our society. You saw your um, own reputation climbing up in the polls and people are willing to volunteer their own assistance. They are ready to provide accommodation in Moscow, in Moscow region, and elsewhere. 
military correspondents are sending the necessary equipment if you know that this or that battalion requires uh, a drone or something else. This is surprising. We only read about such heroic deeds and consolidation of our society in books during times of trouble and tribulation. At the same time, sometimes, especially in Moscow, one comes under the impression that we live in the final part of, you know, a drama by Bernard Shaw, uh, where broken hearts are, where heart breaks. So everything is first fine, and then bombs start falling down. And right now we hear such words spoken as uh, nuclear war, the third war. We understand this is not the second, the third special operation. Well, I'm not talking about us. We, we saw such special operations elsewhere. Our so-called counterparts carry out special operations, and they, they wage war wherever they please, and no one is criticizing them. If something is happening in Libya or Afghanistan in Syria, no one says that this was result, would result in a third world war. So do you think this rhetoric is acceptable at all? Are there any grounds to these discussions, or is it just idle talk? Yes, we hear such rhetoric, but where does it come from? From their own statements. First, one irresponsible politicians a politician says something, then someone else at a very high level at the foreign ministry, the leaders say such things, uh, but we're not going to stay, stay silent and we have to respond. And they simply cling to our words and say that Russia is uh, threatening, but we're not threatening. We are, are simply saying that we will do everything to protect our sovereignty. And this is obvious. And the spe special operations you've mentioned. Well, these were no special operations. These were full-blown wars that were waged. Iraq was virtually devastated. And what about Libya? Yes, Libya has still been unable to rebuild its statehood. And what about Afghanistan? How many years they've been there and how shamefully they fled? Well, it's not about shame. They did leave Afghanistan, yes, and gloriously too. But, you know, first, it was developing the way they wanted it to, not the way it had to. As far as Yugoslavia goes and its dismemberment, after the end of this country. New countries emerged. They had different interests. They had controversies. There were differences internal to, but they were fueling these differences in these countries. And they started to tear Kosovo away from Serbia. I do not quite understand why. As far as our actions go, incidentally, let's look at the legal side of the matter. It's completely in compliance with international law. When Kosovo split under the pressure of Western countries, the ICJ made a decision which says that in accordance with the UN chapter, if a territory splits, you don't need to ask for the permission of the central authorities. And this is what the order of the ICJ says, and this sets a precedent. Very well. And the same should apply to the Donbas republics. They should not ask for a permission from the Kyiv authorities. They've declared their independence. Did we have the right to recognize them? Yes, we did. And that's what we did. We entered into an agreement with them, a treaty of mutual assistance. And in accordance with Article 51 of UN Charter, we provided military assistance to them in full compliance with the UN Charter, whether anyone likes that or not. And that's what they did. They set a precedent. So our actions are completely legitimate. Or let's go back to how the military hostilities in Iraq broke out. They were not legitimate because no one asked for anyone to come. There was no treaty in place, nor was there any 
recognition of a newly established state structure, state entities. They simply came and bombed the country into nothingness. And what happened in Libya? They designated themselves as God's messengers on planet Earth. Right now, they say it should be behavior or life by the rules. But what are these rules? It's just absurd. There are only rules that have to be observed, namely international public law. But what are these norms of the international public law? These are agreements between different countries which constitute a compromise and to which countries have subscribed. And if someone devises their own rules trying to impose them on other countries, then this won't, won't ever fly. It's absolutely obvious. And we believe that sooner or later, and the sooner the better, the whole of international community will get back to understanding that you have to live not, not by rules that are devised by someone, but in compliance with international law, and that's what we should do. President Tokayev. I understand this is a tricky question. You can give different answers to it. But I can't but ask what you think about our special operation. Do you think it was inevitable? The, the, say, w w w the way we think, uh, was it legitimate? And what do people in Kazakhstan think about it? There are different opinions on this matter. I will be frank with you. We have an open society. Civil society has reached maturity, and therefore different points of view are put forth. But I would like to point out that the current international law is based upon UN Charter. But there are two core principles enshrined in the Charter. And these two principles have come into controversy. On the one hand, there is territorial integrity. On the other hand, there is the right to self-determination. The founding fathers of the United Nations, for some reason, overlooked this matter. Maybe they did it on purpose, introducing these two principles at the same time as a compromise. And right now, these two principles have come into confrontation. And Given this confrontation, there are different interpretations that are given to them. Some say that territorial integrity is something sacrosanct, whereas others maintain that any nation that finds itself within a different country, any people, have the right to establish their own country, their own state, and can split of their own volition. Well, it's been calculated already that should the self-determination right be implemented, then instead of 193 countries that are currently members of the United Nations, the world would see the emergence of more than 500 let, or maybe even 600 countries, which is going to be complete chaos. That is why we do not recognize either Taiwan or Kosovo or South Ossetia or Abkhazia. And I think the same principle is going to be applied with regard to these quasi-state territories, which, uh, in our view, are Donetsk and Luhansk. This is a frank answer to your question. Thank you for the sincerity. Mr. President, Coming here, I decided to ask my subscribers and social media about what they wanted to ask you. And ranking high, there were two things, one question and one wish. First, I passed to you the wishes of uh, health, fortitude, and all the best. This was the, the, the first thing they wanted me to translate to you. And secondly, it is a question. They are hitting Donbass on an every day. This week, they hit a maternity ward. And we see images when uh, women have to give birth somewhere in the cellar. You know, people are asking, 
isn't it time to hit them straight and hard? What do you mean when you see, uh, when you talk about this red line after which, after crossing which, you'll start to hit them straight and hard into the centers where decisions are made? Well, look here. We are talking about this special military operation. When carrying out this special military operation, we should not raise the cities and settlements we are liberating to the ground the way it happened to Stalingrad. And this is a principle by which our military guided. Secondly, with regard to the senseless strikes against Donetsk, the line of contact was established eight years ago. And of course, it was heavily fortified. And at this particular sport, local citizens are fighting one another. These are military units recruited from Severn Severodonetsk and also somewhere from near Luhansk, and they are fighting well. And according to military specialists, despite the strikes against the very town, it's senseless to try to storm these fortified lines of contact because it would result in heavy casualties. And that is why, as you know from the media, they are sticking to a different tactic. They are trying to get to the rear trying to circumvent these lines of contact, these fortifications. And this is happening slow and steady. We have a significant advantage in terms of artillery. So it's inevitably going to happen. Now, as far as these red lines go, let me say nothing on this for now. But I have to tell you that we would have to take harsh measures with regard to decision-making centers, as you have said. But this is something which we should reserve for the military and political leadership of the country to make a decision on. And of course, people who deserve such level of reaction from us have to make their own conclusions. They have to understand what they might come across, come against, if they go beyond this red line. And also, I have to say that strikes against residential neighborhoods constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity. But this is a humanitarian matter which is going to be addressed, I'm confident. Just yesterday, there were reports that the EU was planning to accept Ukraine very swiftly. There were three European leaders. They went to Kiev, and they were frightened by sirens blaring, as I was told. And right now, a decision has been made saying that Ukraine is going to be in the EU. Is it good for us? Is it bad for us? Do we not care? And I would also like to ask the same question of uh, President Tokayev. How is it going to play out for your country's development, for the Eurasian Economic Union? Is it going to inspire more confidence in you or not? The EU is not a military bloc nor a military organization, unlike NATO. So I've always said. And in this regard, our position is consistent and clear cut. It's a sovereign decision for any country to either join or not join any economic association. And it's up to this economic association to decide whether to accept any new members. So whether that's good for the EU, it's up to them to decide whether it's going to benefit Ukraine, or it's going to be harmful. It's up to them to make a decision on that, and it's up to the current Ukrainian leadership. But the economic structure of Ukraine will require, will make inevitable that it's going to need subsidies, and it will 
secure Ukraine in the status of a semi-colony, as it were. But at the same time, it is going to enjoy significant support for current needs. Maybe, I don't think it's going to help them rebuild uh, such sectors as the law, such as uh, electronics, uh, aircraft construction, or shipbuilding, uh, because the European Union will be loath to create rivals. Some things will be done, but not everything. We've never been against that. What we've been against is the projection of military power on Ukraine's territory, because that constitutes a threat to our security. But as far as economic integration go, well, it's up to them. It's their choice. And what do you think, President Tokayev? What do I think about Ukraine's adherence to the EU? I don't think it's going to be uh, deleterious to the Eurasian Economic Union. I do not quite understand how this entry is going to happen, because the criteria for adherence are very, very strict. And Ukraine is currently in a very poor state. Maybe there is a special preferential program that's been devised specifically for Ukraine. The current developments in Ukraine, what's happening to it, brings back tragic associations. We remember that the, during the Soviet times, Ukraine was the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. It was a heavily industrialized body. And you, you know, our Krasnodar cry is going to take offense at this designation as the breadbasket. Yes, but uh, I'm also saying that Ukraine was a source of uh, human resources, of leadership and managers, and many Soviet leaders were from Ukraine. Right now, these realities are changing. So getting back to your question about the European Union, a decision has been made to help Ukraine join the EU, and as President Putin has rightly mentioned this is an economic union, and if they deem it possible to accept Ukraine into this economic association, this is how we should treat it as economic reality. Yes, and I've written that and I've spoken about that in public. Over the recent decades, Ukraine has squandered everything that was built in previous decades, the main economic sectors virtually disappeared, and it's sad. And let's just set aside the current special operation and the situation in military affairs, but let's look at the structure of Ukrainian economy. Agriculture still exists, but the rest is in a deplorable state, and there is a very slim potential for rebuilding, they would require dozens of billions in investment to rebuild normal economy. You see, Russia has seen introduction of sanctions, and these sanctions are quite harsh. The central bank had to increase the key rate to 20 percent, but right now this rate has been brought down to 9.5 percent, so it's decreasing. We saw a spike in inflation. It was 17 Right now, it's 16.7, and there is a decrease in trend. Yes, uh, I heard promises of a deflationary spiral. Yes, some specialists uh, keep this threat in mind, and this is something we have to give some thought to, because over the recent months, uh, there was almost zero inflation rate. And of course, we have to think about deflation. We have to take that into account, but see how stronger Ruble has become something. It's bad that we need ruble at you know, a dollar at 70, 70, 75, yes. For anyone who studies economy, you understand your sell, sell something, you export something, you get dollars back into Russia, and if a dollar costs 80, 75 rubles, then you get 75,000, and if dollar is at 50, 56, then you get 
fewer rubles, and you have to spend rubles inside your country. And of course, for importers, it's not that exporters is good, for importers it's bad. But there is also the risk of a very cheap import flowing into Russia. But there are also some benefits. And we see that the Russian economy is far more resilient than our so-called friends anticipated. In other words, this has been achieved through a sustainable microeconomic policy we've been pursuing over the recent years. And the key industries have also got our support. We understand full well there are difficulties with the supply chains. We are waiting for spare parts, and we expect new difficulties to arise. We are fully cognizant of that. But let's look at agriculture. It's grown by 3.2% over four months. It was 2 and 3, and right now it's 32 Let's look at construction. In April, it saw an increase of 7.9%. And since the beginning of the year, the growth rate has been 5.8% in construction. But they say that the market has collapsed. But it's true. That is the increase in construction industries, around 5%. Yes, we see a drop in the car industry. and. In some other sectors, some say that there was a bubble in this industry or that, and we have to take that into account. But be that as it may, the enterprises are still resilient. I wish uh, economic health to our neighbors, despite all the difficulties that are currently transpiring. So the question is whether adherence to the EU can give an impetus to the development of key industries in Ukraine. I don't know. But Ukrainians are a talented people. They've got a great potential. And we assume that sooner or later, the situation is going to normalize. And we're interested in wealthy neighbors. And it's inevitable that relations are going to be rebuilt. We are still sending gas in transit through Ukraine, they still get the money for the transit, incidentally. And everyone is trying to make us send even more gas and pay even more money for transit. Well, it might seem ludicrous and somewhat illogical, but it's happening. But why? Because they don't want to pay to Ukraine. They want us do that in their stead. And that's been happening for dozens of years. So I do not know whether advantages weigh heavier than disadvantages. It's up to the Ukrainians and to the EU to decide. But they don't want to pay. No one wants to pay. It is always the case, Mr. President. That's how the world works. No one wants to pay. It's also true that relations are very volatile and they are rapidly changing if we talk about normalizing relations. You know the thing, what was the problem with 2014 and the coup d'etat in Ukraine? The problem was that former President Yanukovych said that he needed some time to think about the principles of the associated membership of Ukraine in the European Union. The question is why? If you take a look at the principles and demands put forward to Ukraine in order for it to be a membership, uh, to associated member, uh, the many of those demands are redundant. They were redundant, and many of them were harmful. They were bound to destroy uh, certain areas of uh, Ukrainian industry. They opened up uh, the customs gates of uh, Ukraine to cheap goods from Europe, and it would be impossible to work in these conditions for Ukrainian entrepreneurs. It was the case. Ukra uh, Yanukovych didn't say that he didn't want to join the European Union. He said that it was necessary to work on the parameters, but they wanted Ukraine to join immediately. And it led to those crises in, uh, in airplane construction, navigation, etc., etc. 
but no one needs uh, Ukraine manufacturing compatible uh, com competitive aircraft production. In the past, civilian and military aircraft were equipped with uh, Ukraine-produced motors, and now no one needs those motors. And it leads to the collapse of uh, the aviation. No one needs Ukrainian aviation. Boeing doesn't need competitors from Ukraine. Neon is needed from Ukraine, everyone says. Well, apart from the forest from the Carpathians, and uh, wheat and corn, no one needs anything, any other resources from Ukraine than that. This is a very subtle matter. Nevertheless, they want to join it. OK, it's up to you, but there are a lot of problems. Uh, regarding relations, you said that uh, the relations will normalize. But relations are volatile. Let's imagine 20 years ago our relations inside our country with uh, the Chechen Republic. And now the Chechen people are fighting hand in hand with Russians. So we see that the relations are changing. But let's take a wider look. When it all ends, whether the world, the world will it become more, more safe, secure? Will it become safer and secure, more secure for us? Because on the border with Ukraine or Poland, no one knows what the border will be. So on our border, there will be a more reinforced and unfriendly NATO at our borders. Will it be more secure? Or, as you have said, it is impossible to agree on anything with them. It's impossible to respect commitments reached. And as you said, we are just taking back what is ours. I know a lot of people, they wanted, really wanted you to say that, and you said it. Yes, indeed, it is the case. Uh, I openly, st publicly stated that uh, uh, the Soviet Union is, is historic. Ru historically, it is Russia, but it happened that it collapsed. And I would like to stress that we treated the sovereign processes in the former Soviet Union with respect. We have always treated them with respect. We are allies. We are brothers with Kazakhstan. We are members of the same military bloc, the CSTO. We are members of the same economic organization. Who in Russia can even imagine spoiling relations with Kazakhstan on any issue? This is nonsense. We are in favor of strengthening our relations with Kazakhstan. The same would be the case with Ukraine. If we had had allied or partnership relations with uh, Ukraine, no one would have never thought and there would have never been problems with the with Crimea. Because if uh, Russian-speaking population rights uh, had been respected, uh, then no one would have thought that what we see would happen. But uh, they all did it with their own arms. And the nationalism that was cherished in the Soviet Union. And this nationalism, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was actively galvanized. Despite our supply um, at a very minor prices of energy resources to Ukraine, despite us subsidizing the Ukrainian economy, those nationalism was constantly growing. And why? Because of the ambitions of a narrow group of people, of those who follow the ideas of Bandera. And that's it. If we had had normal relations, that this tragedy would have never happened. I assure you. But we are not the ones to be blamed for it. As for the future, first of all, we are ready to build relations with everyone, despite to what's happening today. And secondly, our security guarantees are our army and our fleet. They are the main guarantors. 
As we remember, uh, they are our only allies. Mr. Putin, it's unpleasant to think about it, but why is it so hard for us to to build relations with the Axis? It's always difficult to deal with the Axis, but is it about Ukraine? So is it the problem was that Ukraine was charmed from outside, or we, we can also be blamed? We can also we are also guilty. And I have also a question to the president of Kazakhstan. Do you have the impression that Russia could um, have paid a lot more attention or I can something like that? It's a question to you both. Of course. Firstly, you have just said that we are taking back what's ours. Historically, uh, the territories on uh, the Black Sea coast, we're not claiming uh, that they should go back to Russia, but this Novorossiya region, it emerged after a few wars with uh, the Turkish Empire. What Ukraine are we talking about? It? What does Ukraine have to do with it? It has absolutely nothing to do with it. Western parts of Ukraine joined Ukraine after the uh, Second World War. Stalin took those parts from Poland, Romania, and uh, gave it to Ukraine. And it gave uh, Poland eastern parts of Germany. Territories to the left um, of uh, Dnipro, how it emerged. Uh, Ru Ukraine came to Russia having three territories, Kiev, the Kiev Oblast, Zhitomir, and Chernigov. It was 1,545, the year 1,645 or something. And everything that happened when the USSR emerged in uh, the 20th century, all the territories that Ukraine has now, they were all presented as a gift by Lenin. Donbass were, was first decided to be part of the uh, Russian Socialist Republic, but then the decision was overruled and so they gave it to Ukraine in order to increase uh, the proletariat share in Ukraine. But the situation has changed. Yes, we have agreed to it. We respected everything. You say maybe we should have acted differently. Well, maybe, but when uh, the USSR collapsed, People proceeded from the assumption that the friendship would last, that we would have uh, normal relations between former Soviet Union countries. But unfortunately, despite our desire to cooperate in these frameworks, we have only received all we have received are the demands to step up our economic support. We did everything we could in the 1990s. Russia was in a very difficult situation, but nevertheless, we provided loans, cheap energy, and from decades to decades, we were ready to cooperate in uh, the key industrial areas, aircraft building, naval building, naval construction. And uh, I, I don't think that we could have done more. And despite all of it, a group of people who de facto came to power forcefully or influenced uh, the leadership, it determined the development, the way for development. And then they declared a certain civilization choice in order to uh, preserve the green they have in uh, foreign banks. Excuse me for this expression. Uh, and then they face prosecutions, even faced prosecutions, even in their own country. They are blamed for everything as part of the internal political struggle. You have asked about the about Ukraine joining the EU. They may join it, but do not pose any threat to us. And uh, we I, we don't want them to harm those people who believe to be part believe that they are part of a Russian culture, 
of a Russian language culture. We have never interfered into it. We have never done it. But everything that was done in this regard was done to create the most, uh, by them, was uh, to create the, the best possible conditions uh, to protect those money that were stolen from the Ukrainians. I remember very well all those discussions on the prices on energy, discussions on loans. I really don't understand what we could have done more. I think that we have done everything that we could in order to facilitate the development of interstate relations. Thank you. I have a economic uh, question on economy, technology, and philosophy. There is no ready-made answer to it, but as we're talking about uh, the economy and the future in general, this week we received a piece of news that Google fired an engineer who was in charge of creating the AI. And as this engineer claims that this AI became a sane creature. And uh, th I've read a dialogue between this engineer and the AI. And the AI that has allegedly become sentient. Uh, he said, the AI said that I don't like my place in the world. I think that I'm being abused by humans. He said that he understood that he was much more intelligent than people. So this was a very independent creature indeed. So this engineer was fired, but the technical director of Google says that by 2030, there will have been a massive market of uh, introducing chips to human brain and that humans will cease to be humans and they will become the artificial intelligence. And by 2045, the world will have reached a technological singularity, meaning that people will cease to control and to understand the artificial intelligence that they will have created. By that time, I will have been 65 years old, and I don't want to live in this kind of world. So the question is, for thousands of years, humanity thought that progress was good. Even now, we think that progress is cool, but maybe there is a certain point which limits the progress. Maybe it is today. Of course, we need progress in medicine, in environment, in food. Of course, thousands of years of progress improved uh, the lives of human beings. But will it be the case in the future? And maybe this, uh, tech this technological, technologically lagging behind Maybe it's not that bad. Maybe we need to take a step back technologically to take a look what's going to happen with those creatures and then to decide in which way we would like to develop. The question to both of you. I am completely confident that the progress will be developing in the future. And many years ago, representatives from Kazakhstan to reach St. Petersburg. It took them three months. It took them three months to get from uh, Kazakhstan to St. Petersburg on horsebacks. Now I flew from our capital to St. Petersburg and it took me three and a half hours. I believe that in 100 years, people will be surprised that it took me three and a half hours to fly from one place to another, when uh, it will be possible to do so in 10 or 15 minutes. So this progress cannot be stopped. And of course, uh, there will be robots who will be much superior in terms of intelligence in comparison with humans. But whether they will have empathy, whether they will, uh, will have feelings, this is uh, a matter of discussion today. 
However, I think that progress, whether it, it will be stopped at a certain point, maybe, if we'll face uh, a large-scale catastrophe. But personally, I would like you to see what's going to be with those inventions in 2045. I hope that uh, such intelligent people, I hope they will have the opportunities to work in our countries, in Kazakhstan and Russia. Unfortunately, they promote progress uh, in other countries. The problem is that they leave Kazakhstan and Russia to work in other countries. I think that um, we need to resolve this issue. But on an everyday basis, we we understand that we face the artificial intelligence in our everyday life. And um, many years ago, the artificial intelligence beat Kasparov in a chess game. But after that, uh, the chess tournaments remained relevant. Thank you for mentioning it, but the technical director of Google, who predicted all this by 2045, it was him who said that uh, by that year, in the, in the past, he said that the artificial intelligence would eventually beat uh, hu a human being. So now we understand that computers are already more intelligent than humans, and computers um, are widely spread in our everyday life. Going back, I would like to highlight that Russia is um, the biggest, the largest, and the most important, I would even say, state in the former Soviet Union, and largely thanks to the incumbent president of the Russian Federation, President Putin. And so Russia bears a special responsibility for the security of the CIS countries, for their successful development. And it has the responsibility to make former Soviet Union citizens respect uh, the Russian Federation. I would like to take this opportunity. Maybe it's not um, a very suitable moment, but I would like to uh, put forward certain grievances uh, towards uh, a number of MPs of Russia um, with regards to their statement against Kazakhstan, as well as with regards to statements of cultural figures. And I, I would like to thank uh, President Putin for stating the position of the Russian leadership position on Kazakhstan. Indeed, there are no reasons for our peoples to, to proceed into strife. So, so I don't know what the, those uh, cultural figures and MPs uh, Whose interests do they serve when they comment this or that decision by the leadership of Kazakhstan or this or that process that takes place in our country? Thank you. Well, actually, I know who you're referring to, but probably this is not a place to have this discussion here. It's beef. President Putin, uh, before that, I'd like to comment on this remark. It is important. Look. Under the current circumstances, certainly each state agency, each country is concerned and is worried about avoiding excessive losses and bearing excessive costs that could be avoided. It's only natural. And on a working level, you can always find a solution to any problem if there is a goodwill. And Kazakhstan and Russia do share this goodwill. And I want to make it very clear. Kazakhstan is our partner in the direct and the most widest meaning of this word. Now, as for AI, I think at the moment, the situation you've described, well, it's just a, a, a reflection of what the creative AI thinks that could well be. That's why they decided to fire him. That's why I think so. He's just projecting. 
I would still think that getting an AI that is sentient and can compare with Homo sapiens in every way is still a very far way to go and it's a really complicated thing to do. So uh, I agree with, with what Sister Kaif said. Can you reproduce a soul? Can you create a soul for a machine? Some experts believe that in a moment, it could be possible that the robots will learn to be compassionate, will be able to sympathize. But it's hard to say. Would that be a threat for humanity? Again, a very difficult question, and I wouldn't dare to try and answer it. I don't think that I'm competent enough on the matter to comment. I'll be frank with you. But something that I'm absolutely convinced of, and that was already mentioned by President Tokayev, you can't stop this process, and you have to take it as something given. You can't stop the sunrise or the sunset. Let's see, at a certain moment, China invented the gunpowder and kept the recipe a secret. But you can't do that forever. You can't stop it from getting known. The same applies to nuclear technologies or anything else. You cannot stop progress. And you shouldn't really try. Uh, you shouldn't try and stop the sun from rising. You have to think how to deal with it, whether you want to go sunbathing today or maybe rather not. But the sun will rise anyway. So do you want to grow grain on specific territories or you want to cultivate something else? So you have to take some things for granted. If something is inevitable, you have to learn to live with it and not to stop it or slow it down. If we try to slow it down, we will not succeed. However, if we realize that it is inevitable, then we will search for the options to make use of it to the advantage of the whole humankind, of those achievements of the progress, and I guess this is the way to go. You know, some experts some experts, some medical experts would disagree and say that even a human capacity to show compassion is only conditioned by oxytocin, serotonin, and some neural reactions, a number of hormones, or a re reverse um, connection of serotonin, and can easily be adjusted by pills, by hormones. You are compassionate one day, and you're not capable of showing compassion. Yeah, but still, we have hormones. Uh, machines don't have them. They probably could have some substitutes to that, but not at the moment. Well, maybe, thank God. I'm uh, told that we need to wrap up at this stage. Who is saying you? The bosses? Yes. Not your bosses, mine. So, uh, bosses of this forum, I would say, and temporarily I am at their disposal in the course of those hours that I have the pleasure to moderate this session. So, uh, at the very end, I wanted to share a joke with you. Maybe you have heard, you probably remember that President Obama came up with an idea to calling us a country that is a, a fuel station. And now once the prices went up so dramatically in the United States, there is a joke that Obama used to be ironic about uh, that now uh, we could only state that with a degree of jealousy that is a country that is a fuel station. Well, a uh, very final question at the end. When will that be an end to that? Well, they are making they're forecast on us. Do we have a forecast on for how long their economies could last, for how long their political systems could sustain, whether they are capable of overcoming this crisis? So how do you see this situation? That is a question to both presidents. How do you see the world after? And who are those pullers in this multipolar world? Who are our friends and allies? Well, the political elite in the United States sees everyone from above and frequently internally they treat everyone with uh, a lot of self-confidence and they are uh, they think so well of themselves but not the others and it's definitely not a proof to the fact that united states could call be a superpower. It is a country that has been in existence for 300 years and has become a world leader. That is certainly a reason to respect them. And I have no doubt that the United States is a country having a big future in front of them. But there are internal problems and there are mistakes being made by the ruling elites. And there will be consequences to those mistakes exactly due to the reason that those problems are being 
accumulated and aggregated, we see it from the inflation that is skyrocketing. We see it in other areas, in economics. You've also mentioned energy sector. Well, where are those prices coming from? Are we raising prices to the energy carriers? Well, that's ridiculous. There are energy experts in this room, people who worked in the oil and gas all their lives. Are we raising prices? No, the market is doing that. And who is ruling this market? Them. And as a result of it, the prices are going up. Their activities are affecting the prices. The same applies to gas prices. We've been asking them so many times, do not pay attention to spot prices. Well, you want it, OK, but long-term contracts allow us to give investments in the long run. And you can get resources at market prices tied to uh, well, a basket. No, they want spot prices. All right, you go and pay for it. 1,500 euro for 100,000 cubic meters of gas. And we sell them prices at five times lower. We are basically subsidizing EU economy. And the same applies to the United States. All I'm saying that those controversies are constantly increasing. And if this policy goes on like this, they will keep aggravating. But I still think that uh, American people, and I have a lot of respect for American people, will face the problems that are being accumulated because of the attitude of those elites, because of their actions. And I do hope that American people will put them into place when a political and economic elite, primarily political elites, will have to respond and react to the demand of their population. And finally, inside those countries, including the United States and the international uh, community, the relationship will be structured properly. I'm more of an optimist rather than pessimist. Well, it's really great to hear that you are an optimist, not a pessimist. Really good to hear. President Tukayev, what would you say? I think that the world is indeed in a crisis situation, and those are assessments provided by the United Nations. At the same time, we need to bear in mind that the United States and generally the West has a, a lot of resilience and have a big capacity to withstand all kind of pressures. And in this regard, the United States, as we frequently say, look like beneficiaries of the current situation. They seem to be somewhat outside of this uh, context and do not really get to feel the consequences and the impact of the crisis. The economy of the United States, as I was saying before, is developing quite dynamically, it is modern, it is advanced. But in our part of the world, we still have a lot of opportunities. And I was paying compliments to the Russian economy, not just because I'm a guest here and I'm supposed to say some niceries to the hosts. No, that is really the case. And I am absolutely a strong support of integrational processes regional cooperation, and by no means should we self-isolate and take a defensive stance. No, we should go out to the markets, and the president of Russia was very convincing on that today. In today's world, there are so many good, promising partners. You just need to work with them. You need to find them, and it's good to see that. A whole number of countries are expressing their practical interest in joining the operations of the Eurasian Economic Union. So we have to stay optimistic. Thank you very much. That was President Tokayev. Thank you very much for your openness. That is indeed rare to see at that kind of formal official events. Thank you for being so open regarding my question on uh, DPR and LPR. And I guess those. Um, performers, those cultural activists that you refer to. I know one of them very well heard what you said, and I think it is indeed time that we all understand it's not time to, to make our arguments and fights. And thank you very much to you, President Putin. Thank you very much for spending this day with us. Thank you very much for us not being ashamed now. And thank you very much for being so confident in our shared future. Thank you. Thank you very much.